We're ready to go. All right, so I will call uh, the Capital Planning Committee meeting to order for Monday, July 18th, 2022. It is 7.35 p.m. And I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that this is the first ever time the Capital Planning Committee has actually had a chance to meet live um, because we were formed in March of 2020. So this is our actual first real live meeting. Well, welcome to the old way. <laughs> <laughs> it's been modified. Over yeah. And we have, um, I'll just you know we have a quorum in the room and we have two of our members um, on Zoom as well. Turn it to you, Mr. Board. Uh, we call to order the meeting of the Public Works Planning Board, which is basically um, attending your meetings so we can discuss some of these things jointly and then you'll continue on the meeting after that. Um, we have a quorum of four. Um, how do I know if our fifth was able to zoom in? Would it be on the screen? Yep. Yeah. And we would see the name in the attendees. Okay. So um, Mr. Harding was not sure if he would be able to log in. Um, he was away for the summer and has some you know limited internet capabilities down there. So we wasn't okay. sure. So it doesn't look like he's okay. So we, we will keep an eye out. We, we have a form. All right, great. Uh, so welcome to all those in the room and uh, those watching virtually. As uh, Mr. Bolin noted, this uh, we are going to start with a joint meeting between Capital and Public Works Planning Board. Our first agenda topic is going to be a continuation of the discussion related to the Hopkinton uh, request related to the water main extension in, into South Grove. Um, just for everyone's benefit, um, all members of Capital Planning were asked to watch the original presentation to the select board. Um, I presume. EWPD has done the same, and yes, we, um, we put that on. Yeah. It, so we are we are it's intending to continue the discussion tonight, um, and not kind of go back to square one for uh, an initial conversation. Um, we've also been provided the water master plan. One of the things um, that I have asked Karen um, to do, and I'll let you introduce obviously the consultants as well, um, is from a capital perspective, really help to articulate. Um, you know, where I view our role being in this process of what would self are we doing to the particular areas of the water infrastructure without this Hopkinton request over the next five to seven years? And what incremental things would we now be doing related to the Hopkinton request? And kind of see what the costing essentially would have looked like for us continuing a self growth standalone and then looking at what the incremental is, because while I don't believe our body, and I don't believe your body, unless obviously you're one select board member, um, will be part of the ultimate negotiation if this was to move forward, but there would naturally be negotiations that would continue if this was um, were to continue um, as part of the discussions. So that's um, how I've teed up from a capital perspective. I don't know, Bill, before handing over to Karen, um, if there's anything from a PWPD perspective you wanted to tee up. No, basically, I think as we enter um, probably more joint meetings between the committees, we just have to figure out exactly how we want these meetings to run. And if, if it's going to be, again, more what's happened with some committees in the past, us attending your meeting and then have, having to have some different meetings for business that we have to accomplish, whether it's meeting 20 minutes beforehand or something like that. Obviously, with this new owl, if that's what you call it, 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 we can't start our quarter as part of the meeting separate and yours separate in the same room. Right. So we're we're going to have to figure that out and go from there. I do anticipate, um, based on some of the schedule things you put out, that there will be several joint meetings on this. There will be some other topics that will be more capital stuff. And if our members want to attend and weigh in, but, it, but it's not going to be really something that um, I foresee us looking at some of these things. And, and so some of it comes down to, you know, who's making the ultimate decision. In most cases, it's going to be the, the select. And do they want two opinions on what is being looked at or on things that are going to town meeting and basically at capital items? Uh, I would anticipate that's going to be more from your board or potentially even someone else, you know, if Tom, Tom gets involved or not. But, but we are here to uh, dig in and provide what information is needed from us. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Karen, do you want to do any introductions on your end? Um, sure. Be nice quick. Um, so Timothy's is from Park Corporation. He does our well, Park Corporation does our water system analysis. They do um, our projects, all our design for water system. Um, this master plan that, and I think actually the master plan and um, the Huffington interconnection most likely kind of almost talked about simultaneously. I think it, because um, they work together a little bit, um, but this master plan, um, we had been in the works doing and then um, we actually ended up because of the Ashland interconnection kind of adding into it some of the piping issues which if you're at the master plan there's um you know it talks about the different um non-redundant pipes because we, we haven't really had a chance to look at that too much except for the fisher road loop um but so timothy's um he can take it from here he's got all this um buffer of information for it <laughs> So I have a presentation. I, I thought maybe we could start, if it's okay, talking about the Southboro master plan and then go into the <coughs> Hopkinton interconnections. I think providing some context about what Southboro is planning to do in the next you know, five, 10 years will help for you to understand a little bit about what we're asking, excuse me, what we're asking for uh, with Hopkinton. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay and put up a, what I hope to be a, a relatively short presentation. Too long. Can everybody hear me, including the folks virtually? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to give you guys a an overview of the master plan and what's in the master plan. Um, to keep it moving, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I'm going to try to keep it moving, so I'll stop periodically for questions. Um, and we can. Hold our questions until those breaks. I think um, this will go a little bit quicker. So, just some some brief facts about the system, and you may know some of this, right? So, Southboro has about as a 2020 census, Southboro has about 10,450 people, 85% uh, of which are connected to your your public water supply system. You buy 100% of your water from Massachusetts Water Resource Authority. Uh, you your system is split into two service areas. Think of these as almost two mini systems within your system. We refer to one as the high service area and we refer to one as the low service area. High service, it, it only refers to the, the elevation of that part of town. That part of town topographically is a little bit higher than the low service area. So we call that part of town high service area and we call the other part of town the low service area. Uh, you have two pump stations in your system and these are the main um, supply for your system. Uh, these two pump stations. There's a total of six pumps in those two stations, three pumps in each station. You have three storage mm -hmm. tanks. You have one in your high service area and two in your low service area. And you have about 87 miles of pipe in your distribution system. So here's a map of your distribution system. And I will zoom into a couple of features here. Like I mentioned, you have uh, two pump stations and these two pump stations, we call one the Boland pump station, and the other one is the Hosmer pump station. Those two pump stations are your, your supply. Well, every drop of water that comes into South Coral goes through one of those two pump stations um, from MWRA. MWRA owns two aqueducts that run through South Coral, the Holtman Aqueduct, which was installed in the 40s, and the Metro West Water Supply Tunnel, which was installed in 1995. And you can tell the difference, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the Holtman Aqueduct was installed back when tunneling technology was, was not quite as good as it is today. And you can see how it bends and it weaves and it, it, it dodges probably denser rock in other areas and it dives under things. Whereas the Metro West Tunnel, straight as an arrow. Tunneling technology was much better in 1995. So those two pump stations represent your, your supply. Those are your connections to MWRA. Like I said, you have three pipe, uh, three storage tanks, the Terra Road storage tank, uh, that serves the, the high service area, which is sort of the, the western, northwestern part of town. Uh, the two service areas are divided by this purple boundary here on the map. The left being the high service area, the right being the low service area. Terra serves the high service area, it's up on Terra Road. 
In the low service area, you have the Oak Hill tank on Oak Hill Road. And you have the Clear Hill tank, also sometimes referred to as the Overlook tank, which is your second tank in your low service area. And then, like I mentioned, you have about 87 miles of pipe. That pipe ranges in size from two inch all the way up to 12 inches in diameter. The material of that piping, uh, it's a mix. You have some cast iron pipe, you have a lot of ductile iron pipe, uh, you have some asbestos cement pipe, some PVC pipe. Um, you have quite a, a range of different materials in your system. That's a little bit of an overview, just sort of basic facts about your system. So when we do a master plan, the purpose, uh, there's, a, there's a number of purposes. First off, it's to assess the performance of your system, right? How well is the existing system serving the customer base that you have right now? And then we make an assessment of how well we expect it will serve customers into the future under what we call a build-out condition. In fact, at some point in the future when, when the town population increases uh, and water demand increases, how well will the system perform then? After we do the assessment, then we identify deficiencies. You know, is the system deficient in any way, um, either now or in the future? And then we identify capital improvements, you know, improvement projects that will address those deficiencies that we identify as part of this assessment. So that's what this master plan does for South Pro. So the types of things that we evaluate, the performance factors that we look at include your supply capacity, your storage capacity, system pressure, your available fire flow. That's one of the big things that we use a water system for is to fight fires and the performance of your pipe network. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna spend a minute talking about uh, your system demand, how much water you actually consume in your system because that is these two, these first two factors, supply and storage are directly related to how much water you consume uh, on a daily basis. So right now in Southboro, well, based on on meter data that we looked at for the years 2016 to, through 2019, the average consumption in town was about 915,000 gallons a day, about 0.915 MGD, million gallons per day, we say. In the summertime, that demand picked up, and that this is pretty typical for a system like South Burroughs. We've got a lot of uh, summertime water use, people watering their cars, lawn use is a big use of water, uh, lawn watering, excuse me. Water use picked up in the summertime to about 2.2 million gallons per day. And then we also look at what we call the peak hour scenario. And this is the highest single hour of water use over that three year period that we looked at. Uh, and that peaked uh, to about 5.46 million gallons per day. Now that was an hour's worth of water that was used. We didn't use 5 million gallons in an hour, but if you had projected that out over the course of the entire day, it would have been about five and a half MGD. So in the right-hand column here, we've just converted those million gallons per day into gallons per minute, which is um, the units that we can put into the computer model that we built of your system. And we use that model to evaluate your system. So that's 635 gallons per minute on average, about 1,500 gallons a minute in the summertime. And then it peaked at about just about 3,800 gallons a minute. The, the breakdown by service area, the two service areas are, are fairly well balanced meaning that uh, about half of your demand exists in each service area. So you got about 47% of your demand in the high service area, about 53% of your demand uh, in the low service area. And that's true on an average day, a max day, and on the peak hour. You know, just split almost right down the middle. So then we did a, a fairly um, comprehensive build-out analysis of the town. This is back in 2009. We did a we worked with the town planner at the time and we did uh, an assessment of, of growth in the town, where we thought growth was gonna occur. Essentially what we did is we looked at uh, every undeveloped parcel in town and underdeveloped parcel in town. We looked at the current zoning and we said, based on what's available in terms of undeveloped and underdeveloped parcels, both residential and commercial, how much growth could we expect in town over the next 30 years? Um, we did that back in 2009, and then in 2019, when we updated these numbers, what we did is we looked at the amount of growth that had actually occurred over the last 10 years, and we made an adjustment on that 30-year buildup based on what had actually occurred um, over the last 10 years. 
And so these numbers reflect that adjust those adjusted values. And so we would expect over the next 30 years that your water use on an average day could go as high as 1.2 million gallons. So right now it's about 0.9. So that's about a 33%, about one third increase in water use uh, in the next 30 years. In the summertime, uh, that number goes up to about 2.8 for Southboro, but we have also added Ashland to the system as a, as a summertime customer. Um, this was a project that we set out to do with Ashland back in 2011. I say we, the town, Ashland and Barb, worked together on this project um, to build a, an emergency interconnection for Ashland that they can use in the summertime. And we have a, a reserve capacity for Ashland of up to a million gallons per day um, at that connection. So it's conceivable that in the future, your summertime demand could, could spike to 3.8 million gallons a day with Ashton, if Ashton takes their full complement of 1 million gallons. And then the peak hour, uh, we expect could jump to 8.2 MGD. So before I talk about supply, is there any questions about demand? Projection demand. Quick question. You did the 2019 update. Was, did that increase the demand or decrease the demand versus 2009? That's a great question. It actually went down a little bit. Um, Not surprising because we were doing planning in 2009 and there were some fairly aggressive plans for build out that I don't think actually were supported by zoning changes. We, um, so, yeah, there were some some plans and we also saw, interestingly, we saw some high use customers um, yeah. convert to wells, um, particularly for irrigation, and that dropped the summertime water use down. Uh, quite, quite a measurable amount. So, thanks. Um, yeah, so it went down a little bit. Did, did we see a significant, or Karen, did we see a significant decrease in demand when we went to the feud um, system? For the, for the conservation water rates? Um, at first, and then it sort of leveled itself back out. Um, but each time we kind of we see a little bit of a decrease, but then people, their usage had to go back. But, but big people did put in wells to yes. avoid that. Correct. Some yeah, a lot of businesses. Yeah. And, and do we know if that continues with new construction that people are putting in wells? Yes, we, we tend to recommend it. So um, when they when they ask about it, because they want the second meter, because everyone thinks big sewer, or they think, think mm -hmm. they'll get a lesser, lesser rate and you said put in wells, because it's, it's a waste to have that support. Them. I have a question. Sure. So based on your build out, and I know it was based on zoning. So was any um, thought given to say you have a, a parcel that's industrial zone, mm -hmm. but obviously a, a residential development of some type could go on to that parcel? How would that potentially affect the, as you look to the future, as far as what Southboro's consumption may or may not? That's a great question. So we did not look at zoning changes. So if, if it was zoned industrial, we continue to project in the future that it would continue to be zoned industrial. That's one of the hard things to project, right, is a change in zoning. Um, yeah. So what we did is we we let, we kept the zoning as it is, or as it was in 20, 2009 yeah. for the build-out projection. So we didn't change any zoning. So there's no, um, this does not account for any, any zone changes that might occur. But you did do a, um, you took a parcel with assisted living and other units, and you had, you kind of figured that out versus um, that, that would be like that, what that use was based on the standards of the state was equivalent to what you were using for average. When you say that assisted living. Yeah, over at the, um, over by the library, I think. Yeah, it was because that was part that yes, was there, proposed at the time of the yes, yeah, so that's a good, yeah. So there was a development that was proposed at the time yeah. we did that build up that was a zone, either a zone change at that time, um, or maybe denser than was allowed for yeah. the zoning right that got included in the build up. It did okay, yeah. that was that. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Someone, have a, someone have a computer audio in here. I think it's a public safety communication thing that's piped in, but. No, I'm You'll know when the fire comes. Okay. In your projection, I mean, it seemed almost double in 30 years. 
Uh, what if about 30 percent in the 30 years? But is that based on increased number of units only, or is it based on increased number of units and change of the way in which we use water based on maybe new introduction standards? It's mostly based on an, on an, in, an increase or a decrease in uh, the projection of units and population. Um, so if aggressive water use, say conservation measures were put in place, that's not necessarily reflected in that build out. Okay. Maybe not into you ago, but we've got other projections out there, like school projections. I, I'm just curious how that would align, given that your study was done what, three years ago. Uh, correct. So we did our initial zone, our initial build out back in 2009, and then we updated it in 2019. And what we did is we made an adjustment in 2019. When I say for the, the build out that actually occurred, we actually looked at building permits that were issued um, for new construction in the past. And then we said, all right, we had expected over the next 10 years at the time for it to be this much. Uh, and what we actually saw was this much. Right? So we made an adjustment based on that. I'm curious in your easy since I have a quick refresh on that based on any new data we have. I know that was really focused on it's school based on, children, but still was based on. Well, it was a, it was a demographic study. We can provide it, but for purposes of school building projects, there was two demographic studies done that went well beyond school age children um, based on building permits, et cetera, that may actually bridge you from 2019 to 2021. I don't know that there was a lot of surprises there. It, it kind of goes along with the trend of what you said. I got you. Um, it would be um, interesting to take a look at that, see how that correlates with our um, our residential buildup. Because we we looked at both residential parcels and industrial commercial parcels, uh, huh. so we did a, a projection of both. So that's you know that residential. I think that school piece, if I'm, unless I'm misunderstanding, it, would align maybe with the residential buildup that we did. It looked, but it went the, it was for purposes of school, but it encompassed everything. And it looked at the same sort of data and it goes through and beyond, I guess, you know, through the main part of COVID when obviously trends start to. Yeah, well, that would be good to look at. That would be a good sort of reality check to these numbers. Can I follow up? So, so again, I'm going to go back to an industrial potential parcel. Um, so, with the capacity for the, as, as we're looking at the master plan and projecting ahead, with the, the capacity for the water tower. That's over off of let's see, uh, Tara. I would assume. Sure. Would that, um, if there was a significant increase in say housing, would that um, be able to handle the additional um, storage that might be needed? Well, I'm I'm going to talk about storage. Okay. Um, the short answer is no. There's, there's not enough storage in Tara for. Really, there's not enough storage in Terra right now for the demands that you have right now. And I'm jumping ahead to the okay. storage discussion, but um, I'll hold my question. That's a good question, though. All right, thank you. I just have a relative discussion or question about demand because we've been encouraging well use, and I'm wondering what whether there's any idea from any of our geologists as to what the available water is by well that we can encourage to what maximum limit. Because we're encouraging people to take well water. And offset capacity usage. You know where does that become a problem? That's a great question, and I, I don't know. Okay, um, fair enough. Yeah, that's, fair a, that's a great question. All right, so so demand is one side of the coin. The other the other side is supply, right? We have to make sure that we have access to enough water to, to supply the demand now and in the future. And so, like I mentioned, every drop of water that South Coral buys goes through one of two pump stations, either Poland or Hosmer. And so we measure your, your capacity, your supply capacity by the capacity of those stations. So the bowl and pump station, quick overview of what's in here. Bowl and pump station has three pumps, each rated for 750 gallons a minute. And the way we design pump stations, um, particularly larger ones like this, is that we make sure that we have one pump that can do the, the lower demand periods of the year, like the winter and the, in the early spring. We add a second pump for summertime demand. And then we have a third pump in reserve that is essentially a redundant pump for if and when you need to take one of those other pumps out of service. So really it's two regular duty pumps, two pumps that will alternate service, and then one pump is a backup. So Bolin has three equally sized 750 gallon a minute pumps. Hosmer has, for the same reasons, has three equally sized 1,000 gallon a minute pumps. Now, if you remember, I said that the high service area and the low service area are, are 
relatively well matched in terms of demand. So why is Boland, I mean, excuse me, why is the Hosmer station so much larger in terms of capacity than uh, Boland? It's because we added capacity at Hosmer to supply the Ashland interconnection in the future, right? So there's added capacity in that station for Ashland. So how does your station capacity compare to your demand? Well, in your low service area, you have about 2.9 million gallons a day of capacity in the Boland station. And that's against 2.5 million gallons a day of demand, right? And that demand, the 2.5, that is your uh, maximum day demand, your summertime demand for now and in the future. Um, yes, for it's now and in the future. And then in Hosmer, Excuse me, the, the, excuse me, the low service has the Ashland demand included in the 2.88. That's got a million gallons a day for, um, for Ashland. So you have 2.8, almost 2.9 million gallons of capacity against 2.5 million gallons of demand. So you have a little bit of extra capacity in your, uh, in the Hosmer station, the low service area of about 0.4 MGD. In the high service area, this is the Boland station, you have about 2.8. 1.6, 2.2 million gallons a day of capacity against 1.35 million gallons a day of demand. And that's existing demand and demand and you know, build out demand in the future. So that leaves you about 0.81 uh, million gallons a day of, of extra supply capacity in that station. So the town has, has just over a million gallons a day of, of extra capacity in the system. So you are well served by your pump station right now in terms of the capacity that you have for, for today, for the projected build out, and even if that projected build out turns out to be a little bit less um, than what actually occurred, you've got some buffer room there. All right, so uh, any questions about supply before I move on to storage? Okay. So, like I mentioned, you have three tanks. You have one tank, the Terra Road tank is in your high service area. This is a 1.3 million, gallon, uh, million gallon tank. It was built in 1960 and it's a, a standpipe style tank, meaning that it's got water from the ground all the way up to the top. In the low service area, you have two tanks. You've got the Clear Hill tank, also sometimes called Overlook. That's a relatively small tank. It's only 0.46 million gallons. It only, only stores 460,000 gallons. It's 40 feet in diameter. It's also a standpipe. Uh, and it was built in 1930. And then the last tank is the Oak Hill tank. This is your smallest tank. This tank is only 275,000 uh, gallons. It's a relatively small tank. It's, it's only 25 feet in diameter, but it's about uh, 85 feet tall. Uh, it was 75 feet tall, excuse me. Um, so this thing, if you've ever seen it, it looks like a pencil. It's just this skinny tank. Um, very narrow, uh, but very tall. It's also a standpipe style tank. And this one was also built in 1930. Um, in general, these tanks are in, in good or very good condition. Um, the town has, has invested in the maintenance that these tanks require, which is to have them taken out of service periodically, stripped down of all the paint that's on them, and then repainted, recoated, um, make repairs that, that need to be made on a periodic basis. This might be, you know, welding, um, you know, uh, metal that has deteriorated well they do metal onto it right so these tanks have been well maintained and they're in general in pretty good shape um, so physical condition of the tanks is good but the physical condition is not the only thing we look at we also look at the capacity of these tanks and whether or not they are serving the needs of the town and so when we look at storage tanks every storage tank has three components and i don't mean that it's physically separated into three components but it has the storage in it is broken out into, into three components. The first one is equalization storage, and that is the storage at the very top of the tank. And that's the storage that the town uses on just a day-to-day -day basis. This is what uh, water you guys tap into on a regular basis every day. Um, if you see the tank fluctuate over the course of the day, that fluctuation, you know, that 10 feet of fluctuation, that's your equalization storage. And that's for operation, right? That's so that the pumps in the stations have an opportunity to, to turn on. Right, so the way your system works and the way many, many systems uh, across the country work is that you fill your tanks with the pumps, the pumps shut off, the water comes out of the tanks, 
you let the water in the tanks drain by let's say 10 feet or so, right? When it hits that 10 foot mark, the pumps turn back on and they refill the tank. And you do that all day, every day. You just let the water fluctuate. Um, and you only let it fluctuate by about 10 feet because um, the amount of water in that tank is directly proportional to pressure. Um, but we don't want the pressure to fluctuate too much. So we only let it fluctuate by 10 feet. So we look at equalization storage and there's no set requirement about exactly how much water you need to have in your storage tanks um, and how big your storage tanks need to be. Um, but generally speaking, your equalization storage is about 15% of your summertime demand. And again, it's, it's an operational thing. You want to let your pumps turn off in the summer at some point um, so that not running all day long. Um, so if you have about 15% of your storage in that, that 10 foot range, that'll give your, your pumps a chance to, to, um, to shut off and to, to kind of rest for a little while. So we say about 15% of your summertime demand is what you want to have for equalization. The next, and, and frankly, the biggest part of your storage is your fire storage. How much water you have sitting in reserve to fight fire, right? And this is calculated, the volume that's needed is calculated based on the largest fire that you would have to fight in that, in that part of your system times the duration that it would take you to put out that fire, right? And we get these numbers from um, an agency called uh, the Insurance Services Office, ISO. They set the, um, the fire flow requirements for community like South Park, right? So we take, um, you know, they'll say, look, this part of town needs 3,500 gallons a minute to fight a fire, which is a lot of water, 3,500 gallons a minute. And you have to plan for a three hour duration, meaning that we have to take 3,500 gallons a minute and we have to multiply that by 180 minutes to come up with a, an amount of water to sit in reserve to fight a fire. And that can be really significant. That can be over 600,000 gallons of water sitting in reserve. And then the last piece is your emergency storage. And this is if you have a, you know, a catastrophic break in your system, like a water main break or a pump failure or other, some other disruption in service um, in your system where you have to run off of your, your tanks and you don't have access to the supply. And we, for every system is different in terms of how much emergency storage it needs to have. It's all based on how vulnerable you are to disruption in service. Um, Southport's got a fairly robust pipe network. Um, you can move water around the system. Um, you've got a lot of emergency things put in place in your pump stations, meaning you've got redundant pumps, you have emergency backup power, the stations are very new. Um, so the amount of water that you need in the event of emergency is not that significant. It's not um, a huge amount of water. It's about, we estimate it's about 20% of your average day demand you should have sitting in reserve. And that should give you enough time if you've gone through all of your, your fire storage and all of your equalization storage, that should give you, that 20% should give you time to get out there and fix that water main or get that pump online or do what you need to do to get, get your connection back up and running. Um, so those are the parameters that we use to size storage to evaluate your storage against. And then the last one is what we call usable storage. So we look at all this water that we think you should have in storage and we say it all has to be usable, meaning that it all has to be located above an elevation that will provide everybody 20 pounds. DEP, 10 state standards, AWA, they all say you can never let your water pressure in your system go below 20 PSI. So if you're, uh, tanks, let's say, are particularly short and they don't provide everybody with 20 PSI, or there's some times where they don't provide everybody with 20 PSI, that's a problem. That means we can't access the water, let's say, at the bottom of those tanks, because that water won't provide everybody 20 PSI. So when we look at these volumes of water in your storage tanks, we got to make sure that they're all useful, meaning that they're all above 20 PSI. So, with those numbers in mind, we make an estimate of how much water we think you should have in, in both your high service area and your low service area, how much water you should have in storage. The number of equalization storage in the high, this is, this is Terra. The equalization storage in the high, we're putting at about 195,000 gallons. We're estimating that you need about 540,000 gallons of, of fire storage in the high service area and about 112,000 gallons of emergency storage. So our recommendation is that you have at least 850,000 gallons of water stored in the high storage set. In the low, it's, it's about 368,000 for equalization. It's about 630,000 gallons for a fire and then 328,000 gallons for emergency storage for a total of about 1.3 million gallons of storage. And these numbers include the build out numbers that, that I talked about earlier. So this is 
existing numbers, build out numbers, and the water fraction. So this is about, move to the next slide here. So we're recommending that you have about 2.2 million gallons of total storage in your system. And like I mentioned, we can only count, you have in your system right now, just, just a little over, um, just about 2 million gallons of storage in your system right now. The problem is it's not all usable, right? For example, only about 500,000 gallons of the storage in Terra is considered usable. Meaning if we let the water level in Terra drop more than about 20 feet, we start to see a reduction in pressure in the, the, the homes right around the Terra tank, right? They start to drop below 20 PSI. We can't let that happen. So we're limited to just the top few feet of that tank. So it's a 1.3 million gallon tank, but we only have about 500,000 gallons of usable storage in it. In the low service area, we have about 480,000 gallons of usable storage. And we're recommending that you have about 1.3 there. So when you add up the deficit in storage, what, where you're falling short, you're about 1.2 million gallons of storage short in your system. Meaning that you, to meet the recommendations that we, we put in this report, you need to add 1.2 million gallons of usable storage. In the system. And that's an important point that's gonna come up in the recommendations later. Um, so before I move past storage, are there any questions about this? So is that implying that there's too much stress on pump stations and shorter useful life? No, it's not necessarily that there's too much stress on the pump stations. What it means is that uh, it, the town is at risk if there were a really significant fire or there was uh, an emergency situation, that they wouldn't have enough water sitting in storage um, to provide that. Now the pump stations would come on, and you know they would they would pump as they normally do, but it just wouldn't be enough water for the things that you that you should be finding. Good question: Is this now a deficit uh, for the twenty-year plan, or a deficit as of today? It's a deficit for the the twenty-year plan. Okay, so we're not this far behind. You're not today. you're not quite this far behind today. Um, that's a good question. It's probably today. It's probably closer to. Um, probably closer to about a million. Because remember, the, the emergency and the equalization are percentages of your demand. Okay. Just want to note, I do see some hands up. No, I, we're not here, but remotely. I think we're just going to keep going, just let you get through your presentation, and we will come to those because we do have a whole agenda. So just want to balance the time. So, the next thing we did is we did we did a hydraulic assessment, right? This is a, an assessment of your pressure and your a bit your ability to fight fires. Yeah. A couple of things when we talk about pressure in a system, like I mentioned, we can't let the pressure ever go below twenty psi. But twenty psi is the absolute bottom. We'd like to keep pressure higher than that. We'd like to keep pressure in the thirty-five to eighty psi range. That's considered desirable. 85 to 30, uh, eight, excuse me, 35 to 80 PSI. That's a desirable pressure. It can go higher. It can go up to 100, 110 PSI uh, without too many issues. Um, but that sweet spot is really in the 35 to 80, maybe 35 to 90, depending on what, what you read, but that's our sweet spot. So when we ran, we built a computer model of your system and we ran um, your existing demands in the system. And we looked at what the pressure is throughout the system. And in the high service area, across all of your demand scenarios, average, max, and peak. Your pressure range from about 23 PSI up to about 115 PSI, depending on where you are. And these lower pressures, these 23 PSI, these are um, right at the base of the tank, at the Terra tank, right? Um, Terra is built at the top of the hill. Your lowest pressures are always at the top of the hill. Um, it makes sense that the customers are right next to the tank. Surprisingly, it might sound counterintuitive, but they're the customers that get typically the lowest pressure. Um, and so those are, the lowest pressures there, but nobody below 20. In the low service area, pressure range from about 31 to about 133 PSI. Um, there's a couple of spots in the low service area where the ground surface elevation is very low, left the base of the uh, sub area reservoir is very low, uh, and they have very high pressure there. We look at the available fire flow. We use the model to, to predict um, fire protection around the system. 
And fire protection is generally pretty good, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in detail in a second. But it ranged from about in the high service area from about 572 gallons per minute on the low end to 3,500 gallons a minute and above in many areas of the system. So many areas of the system have very robust fire protection. There is an area that's closer to this 500, um, and I'll, I'll show you that area in a second here. And then in the low service area, it ranged from about 665 gallons a minute up to 3,500 gallons a minute for fire protection. In general, the system is very robust in terms of fire protection, but there is one area that it's, um, it's a little bit problematic. And then we looked at, when we ran these scenarios, we looked at the, 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 the system's ability to fill the storage tanks because um, under your maximum day demand scenario, you need to be able to fill your storage tanks. If you can't fill your storage tanks on a max day because you don't have enough supply or, or your supply is not working the way it's supposed to. And under existing conditions, you have no problem filling your tanks. You're filling your um, high service tank at a rate of about 680 gallons a minute, and you're filling your low service tanks at about 1,100 gallons a minute. So you've got no issue filling your storage tanks uh, in the summertime. That is uh, under existing conditions. Under future conditions, the pressures did not change that much. Um, we see that this, the same ranges in the high service area under build out, this is with new demand. We see a little bit lower in the low service area, just a hair lower under a peak hour scenario, uh, went from 30 to 29 PSI. And it went from 133 PSI to max day to 131. So just a, just a hair lower uh, in the future. Uh, fire flow did go down a little bit um, on the low end, um, but not, not significantly, just by you know, 10, 15, 20 gallons a minute on the low end. Uh, in the future, with the pump stations you have, um, you're still able to fill your storage tanks on a, on a max day in the summertime, which is good. So generally, you know, the peak, the build out in the future did not have a significant impact on the hydraulics of the system and your ability to fight fire protection. I'm going to talk about um, fire protection in a little bit more detail here. I'm going to show you what the model produces for uh, a fire flow analysis. So what we did is we had the model produce a color coded map for us to illustrate how much um, flow is available throughout the system. So we ask the model, when we do this, we ask the model two questions. We ask the model to tell us how much water it can draw to each node in the system. And a node is this, this dot that represents either a bunch of customers or a pipe junction or some other feature in your system. We ask it, how much water can we draw to a, a specific node while keeping that node above 20 PSI? And that's key, right? We can't let it go below 20 PSI. And the more water we draw to that node, the lower the pressure gets. So the model shuts shuts down when it hits 20 PSI and says, right, this is the most flow I can get to this node at 20 PSI. So that's the first thing we ask it. The second thing we ask it is how much flow can we draw to a node while keeping all of its neighbors above 20 PSI? Because we can't let a fire event um, in one area cause pressure somewhere else in the system to drop below 20 PSI. Again, that 20 PSI number, that's a hard factual. We can't go below that um, under any circumstances. And so this color-coded map shows you how much fire flow is available in the areas of the tank. These red dots, this is where fire flow is less than 1,000 gallons a minute. The yellow dots are where it's between 1,000 and 2,000. Green is between 2,000 and 3,000, and blue is where it's 3,000 up to 3,500. We told the model to stop at 3,500 because there's no place in your town based on the ISO requirements that requires more than 3,500 gallons a minute. And you say you've got a lot of blue dots, a lot of blue nodes, a lot of areas in town that get, they get 3,500 gallons a minute or more of fire protection. You also have a lot of green areas, right? That are up around 3,000. The yellow areas, you got a lot of yellow, which is you know between 1,000 and uh, 2,000 gallons a minute. And generally speaking, between 1,000 and 2,000 gallons a minute is more than enough fire. I mean, more than enough um, fire flow to put out uh, a fire in a, a predominantly residential uh, community. That's plenty of water. It's, it's this area here that's consistently below a thousand that um, causes a, a little bit of a, of a problem. And the reason that this area, uh, this part of town falls below a thousand gallons a minute is because it's a lot of this neighborhood is up on the top of the hill. Now we can actually draw quite a bit of water to some of these nodes. We can draw close to a thousand gallons a minute to some of these nodes. 
But what happens is when we start to draw water down Parkerville Road to serve these neighborhoods down here, the act of pulling water down Parkerville Road actually causes the pressure in this neighborhood to drop. And it gets very close to 20 PSI by pulling all that water down through here. And that is what's tripping the model and telling the model to stop. Say, look, we can only get maybe 800 or 900 gallons a minute at some of these nodes because we're causing other nodes in this neighborhood to fall below 20 PSI. And the reason for that is, like I said, it's, it's because this neighborhood is kind of at the top of a hill, particularly these streets up in here. These streets here are, are right at the top of a hill. These ones aren't quite as high, but they are about as far from the Terra Road tank and from the pole and pump station, which are the supply sources for this part of town. They're about as far as you can be in this part of the system. Um, and so they're, they're somewhat isolated from, like I said, from Terra and from Boland. And so they don't have anything to keep their pressure stable. They don't have very stable pressure here um, when we start to open up a hydrant and pull a lot of water out here. So they, they fall very quickly. Their pressure drops very quickly um, if we were to open up a hydrant down here. And that's why this area here is, is consistently red. And this is something that we'll address um, in our recommendation section. And then I'll talk one more thing about fire flow and then I'll open it up to questions on fire flow. So there are six areas in town that we pay specific attention to. And these are the areas in town that ISO has, came, has come out and evaluated specifically. And these are areas where ISO has deemed that the, the density of development or the type of development requires special attention uh, when it comes to fire protection. So this is the Marlboro Road at St. Mark School, the Trottier School, the Finn School, um, Highland Street at Parkerville Road, Mount Vickery Road at Porterville Road, and the Oregon Road at Woodland Road. And ISO came out and they did an assessment of these areas. This is probably 15, 20 years ago. And they said, based on what they saw at the time, this is how much fire flow they recommend for those parts of town, for those intersections, right? So for example, at the Mary Finn School, they said, based on the school construction and, and the density of that neighborhood, they recommend 2,250 gallons a minute of fire protection at that, at that location. At the time, ISO went out and they did a hybrid flow test to estimate what is actually available in that area and they compared it to what's required. So again, looking at the Mary Finn School, they said, look, we recommend 2,250. We opened up a hydrant and we were only able to get um, about 1,500 gallons a minute after. We have since made improvements to the system. We made a lot of improvements to the system to improve circulation and improve fire protection in the town. And so we ran these locations through the model with these new improvements that we've made to see how fire flow has improved over the last 10 years. And we've been able to get fire flow, for example, at the American School, we've been able to get it up to almost 2,600 gallons a minute. Right. So we've been able to do all these uh, improvements we've made. We've really improved fire protection there. Uh, we've improved it at uh, St. At St. Mark's, at Marble Road at St. Mark's, um, at Highland, uh, you know, Highland and, and Parkerville Road. Again, we, we've gotten it up to about 1,900 gallons a minute. In Oregon and Woodland Road, uh, we've gotten it up quite a bit. We've gotten it up to almost 2,800 gallons a minute. So through all the investment that the town has made in the system, and we're talking pipe improvements, um, new pumps, um, improvements to some of the, uh, the pressure reducing valves that move water between the system. We've really been able to improve fire protection at these locations. The two locations that we're still working on are the Trottier School and the intersection of Mount Vic and Cordoville Road. Go back to my map here for a second. The, the issues with these two locations actually has nothing to do really with those two locations and it has to do with this neighborhood right here. When we draw water to the Trottier School, or when we draw it to the Mount Vic Corridor Road intersection, which is right here, it actually causes um, pressure to drop in this neighborhood, right? So this is one of these sort of unintended consequences. We open up a hydrant on one side of town, and it actually causes pressure to drop somewhere else in town. Um, and so what's happening is the model is telling us, uh, hey, we can't get the fire protection to this other feature in town, this other location in town, because there's another part of town that's dropping below 20 PSI. Um, and so that's what's going on at those, at those two locations, primarily at Trottier School. That's um, what we really noticed at Trottier School. 
um, that when we tried to run fire protection um, at the Trotter School, um, it just kept dropping this neighborhood down below the line. Okay, any questions on fire flow before I move on? And talk, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is just the pipe network in general. I could probably ask questions all night on that particular topic, but <laughs> interesting that you kept going on Trotter, but there's a neighborhood school right next to it near it. Yep. Which is the subject of potential rebuild, renovation, construction. It does not have sprinklers, which I know will factor into somehow you think about this up so there would be hydrants. Any thoughts off the top of why you're so focused on Trotter when they're basically adjacent to each other? So Trotter School is how ISO identified that part of the system. Okay. Right. So we looked at, we very specifically looked at a node at Trotter, but you can use that as a surrogate for the the area immediately around it. Okay. But when you're planning for Neary, by all means, you should be you should be looking at fire protection for sure and what's appropriate there for fire protection. Yeah. Any other questions on, on fire protection? Right. Okay, so the last thing uh, I want to show you is the our assessment of the pipe network, right? So we, we talked about pumps, we talked about tanks. The biggest asset that your system owns is your pipe network. You guys have almost 100 miles of pipe in the ground. And so we look at um, we look at the, the performance of the pipe in the system, how well is it performing? Um, and then we look at a ranking system for the pipe so that to sort of inform the town's pipe renewal program. Every town should have a pipe renewal program where you're, you're replacing pipe on a, on a continuous basis um, so that none of the pipe gets you know, excessively old or deteriorated. So we'll start with the performance assessment. So again, we use the model that we built. We ran all those demand scenarios through the model, and we looked at things like velocity and pressure loss in the pipe network. And these criteria that I have out here on the screen, these are from AWWA, American Waterworks Association. They have all the guidance documents on how to build a model, how to run a model, how to evaluate a system like this. And what they say is that under normal demand scenarios, fire flow excluded, you shouldn't have any velocity in your system greater than five feet per second. You shouldn't have any head loss, which is a measure of pressure drop in your system greater than, we measure head loss in feet, um, greater than 10 feet per thousand feet of pipe. So that's about uh, four pounds of pressure drop, four PSI of pressure drop per thousand feet of pipe. And then in larger diameter pipes, you shouldn't have any more than three feet of pressure drop uh, per thousand feet of pipe. Fortunately, you don't have any pipe greater than 16 inches, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, but when we ran the model for, uh, for velocity and for pressure drop, we found that you didn't have any piping outside of your pump stations, and we're allowed to have it in our pump stations, but you didn't have any piping outside of your pump stations that was greater than five feet per second. And you had just a handful of pipes in your system that exceeded this 10 feet per thousand feet criteria. And when I say just a handful, it was just a, it was like two or three pipe sections and they only amount to about 200 feet of total pipe in the entire system, right? So a tiny, tiny fraction of the total pipe in your system. So the impact, the total impact that those couple of pipe sections are having on your system is very, very, very minor. Um, so generally the pipe seems to be performing, um, performing well. Um, but like I said, to inform your renewal program, we, we came, we used the model to come up with a, a ranking system of your pipe so that you can start thinking about uh, renewal in the system. And I'll show you that. All right, so I don't expect you guys to read this whole thing here, <laughs> but this is just a sample of, of how we did it. This goes on for pages and pages and pages. Um, but what we did is we took your pipe network, we spit it, we pushed it into the model, and we indexed the entire system based on the street and the cross street. So we have a real granular look at your, at your pipe network. So for example, we, you know, we have pipes on Main Street. We identify that as the pipe on Main Street between you know, this street and that street, right? And we did that for every, every pipe section in the model. We input the physical attributes of that pipe, its length, its size, its material. If we knew the age that it was, um, if we knew the year it was installed, we'd put that in there so we could get age, whether or not it was a dead end pipe or not, you know, at the end of a dead end street, or in, and excuse me, and how many water main breaks, if any, that pipe section has had in, in the past. We scored all those, right? We gave all of those factors a score. And then we weighted those scores to come up with what we call an attribute score. 
And this is a score from zero to five, five being the worst, zero being the best, um, to weight basically the physical attributes of that pipe. How concerned should we be about that pipe based on its, its setting, its break history, its age, that kind of thing. We then, and this is where we use the model, we then looked at the performance of each pipe segment. We looked at the relative importance of that section by looking at how much flow it carries on a, in the summertime or on an average day, right? We use the amount of flow that it carries as a surrogate for um, its relative importance. So pipes that carry a lot of water are relatively important in your system. Pipes that carry very little water are, not, are probably not serving a very good neighborhood or probably relatively, um, I won't say unimportant, all your pipes are important, but less important than some of the bigger ones. We looked at velocity. We looked at the internal roughness of the pipe based on some estimates of material and, and age. And then we looked at that pressure loss, that head loss gradient that I was talking about previously. We assigned each one of those a score that we weighted those scores and we spit out a, what we call a performance and importance score. We then added that to the attribute score to come up with a score that can go up to 10. 10 being, I'll say the worst, zero being the best. So any pipe that's a 10, that's a big red light that should go off, right? I got, I got a real problem with this pipe. Um, any pipe that's a zero, probably not a problem. You and your system, you didn't really have any pipes that scored much higher than six, which is good, right? Um, like I said, your system is fairly robust, it's well balanced. You're able to move water around the system and you're not overly dependent on too many pipes. You have a couple of pipes that we're gonna talk about, but overall you're not overly dependent on too many um, pipe sections. We then took this data and we put it onto a plan so that we could graphically see where these pipes actually are. And then we color coded that based on which ones were the most critical in the system and which ones are the least critical. The red pipes, I'll reconnect, you can keep going. Sure. So you're still alive. Yeah. So. Okay, so the red pipes are pipes that are most critical. And I don't, when I say critical, I don't necessarily mean that, that these are on the verge of breaking or that you're gonna have some kind of catastrophic failure with this pipe. It means that it could be in poor condition. It could be very, very important to your system. Um, it could be, you know, the sole source is applied to a, a big area of town. There's a number of things that make this particular pipe critical. And by being at the top of the list, what it means is that when you're doing your pipe renewal, this is a pipe that you should be paying special attention to. Right? You should be looking at this and, and deciding what you want to do with this pipe. And maybe it means replacing the pipe. Maybe it means adding a backup pipe, you know, a redundant pipe. Maybe it means creating a loop in the system somewhere. There's a number of ways to address these critical pipes, but these are the ones at the top of the list that should be looked at. And so what we see here is the most critical pipes in your system are the ones that connect the bowl and pump station to the terra tank, right? Those carry the most flow. And this is, it's not the only path to the terra tank, but it's the predominant path that the water takes when it goes up to the terra tank, right? And so this, these uh, pipe segments here, these rank the highest in the whole system right here. You had a couple of, of oddball ones that came up kind of high on Main Street. Um, and I think there was one of their small red one somewhere else, but it was really this piece right here is the most critical in the whole system. Another one that ranked very high was the one on um, Newton Street, which is actually getting replaced right now. It'll be getting replaced uh, this summer. Um, this one also ranked very high, not quite as high as these, but, but also very high. And you had a lot of pipe, you've got a lot of pipe in your system that's blue, a lot of pipe that's green, um, and some of the yellow pipe, right? So in general, your, your pipe system is, is in good condition and it's it's serving you well, but there's a, a handful of places here where we're going to want to um, turn our attention when we start talking about pipe renewal. That's that? right. Yes. What's the length of the critical, <clears throat> most critical pipe uh, on tower? What do we? How, how long length of that is? So this is about about eight thousand feet, I think. This stretch right here. Now. One of the reasons this is so critical is like I said, it's the predominant path to the terra tank. But you, you may have noticed, or you may have heard, because we've talked about this in the past, that there's a long dead end here um, on Fisher Road that could be connected to Presidential Drive. 
right? There's there's a sort of this gaping hole right here in this pipe, right? That could provide a backup to this pipe right here. Right. So if we were to make this connection right here, we could take a lot of the pressure off of this main because this would open up this as an avenue for flow to come out of the pump station and go this way around and up to the tank. Actually, it even come down here some. Right. It would also, this whole neighborhood right here is served by the single connection on Sears Road. This is a big neighborhood. Right. Having a second connection right here will provide redundancy for that neighborhood, provide some backup. Um, in the event that we lost any of this pipe on Sears Road, right? So there's a lot of benefits to making this connection right here. Although it is kind of a complicated connection because um, it has to cross underneath a railroad track to make it. So it's not very long. It's only about 500, 600 feet, but it has to cross under a railroad track, which is one of the reasons it hasn't been done so far. Um, it can be done. It just, it hasn't been done so far because easements need to be gotten. It's, it's a process. Um, but that's that is uh, one of the most critical pieces of uh, infrastructure we think the town should invest in the, in the future. This will be this is one of the recommendations at the at the end of this report because it does a lot for the town. It, it provides backup for this neighborhood and it does take a lot of the pressure off of this this critical pipe right here. Not all the pressure, but it does it does help. All right, that's that is it on piping. Any questions on piping? Before I move on. So we looked at everything in the system. We looked at pipes, your pumps, your tanks. And what we identified um, in terms of, we'll say deficiencies, um, things that we think uh, is where you should focus your attention. It's the pipe on Newton Street, which you're already replacing right now. The storage deficit that we talked about, the storage deficit in the low service area and the, the storage deficit in the high service area. Those are uh, very important. Uh, the poor circulation and the redundancy in the high service area from Boland to that northeast quadrant. Again, that is this area that I'm talking about up here. That's what that recommendation is about. The lover lane, the lover's lane water main, right? That's the one that takes the water from uh, Boland up to the tank, that and part of Northboro Road. Um, that is a 50 year old pipe made of asbestos cement. Now, 50 years old is about the average water main age that we want to see in a system, right? Some cast iron pipe and duct we expect to get 100 years out of. Um, asbestos cement, uh, if it's bedded well, it's, if it's good soil, you might get long life out of it. But we've had a lot of issues with asbestos cement pipe. Um, it's very fragile, um, it breaks very easily if you're digging around it. Um, so, that being a 50 year old asbestos cement pipe has a little bit of concern. Um, it's reaching the end of its service life um, and it does carry all that water up the terrace. So, this is one of, we think, one of your high priorities moving forward. Can I ask a quick question on that? Is yep. that included in the 8,000 yes. feet you were talking about? Yep. So, this um, this section of pipe here, it's, it's a number of streets. It's, um, and I forget all of the names I plotted, but this is um, yeah. Northboro Road, and then part of this is Lover's Lane, and then there's um, Blackburn. Blackthorn Road. Okay. Um, there's a number of streets that make up this okay. this piece of pipe right here. Thank you. Yep. What's the diameter of that pipe? That's 12 inch. Yep. And then the last critical issue is that available flow, a fire flow at Trottier and at that portable road um, intersection. Uh, it's taking a look at those. So then our recommendations are, you know, institute a capital improvement program. Um, to address these, particularly a, a pipe renewal program, a long-term pipe renewal pro program, as well as these more critical ones that I've identified. Look at the town's flushing program. We didn't talk much about water quality and flushing, but that's something that we've been working with the town on, is input a mm -hmm. flushing program, a unidirectional flushing program to improve the performance of um, system flushing. Address the fire flow at Trottier in Cordoville. And to do that, um, before I move on to that, to, to do that, like I mentioned, at Trottier, what is a particular concern, not concern, but what's what's causing us to drop is that one neighborhood, the Fairview Skyler Drive neighborhood. That's what's causing us to, I won't say fail our fire flow test at Trottier, but it's what's keeping that fire flow down. So we think that if we actually put in a small pump to serve that neighborhood, and we isolated that neighborhood from the surrounding streets, right, in terms of hydraulically, 
right? What we what that would do is that would prevent the pressure there from dropping when we open a hydrant at Trotter, and we could actually get more water at Trotter without dropping the, the pressure in this neighborhood. Um, and we could do that with a relatively small pump system um, that we could put um, off of Deerfoot Road. Uh, I'll show you where I think that is. By putting a small a small pump system here in the woods off of Deerfoot Road, this is Deerfoot Road, we could pressurize this whole neighborhood and keep the pressure up so that when we do open up a hydrant elsewhere in town, these folks are relatively <laughs> unaffected by, by that pressure. That's a recommendation. And then, oh, excuse me. And Jim, that, that'd be um, your foot road on the left side, the dead end section, correct? South, um, side. South, side. South, side. South side. Yep. It actually wouldn't even be on Deerfoot Road proper. It would be there's actually a main that cuts through the woods yep. there. It would be on that main. So those were the three big recommendations we had. These three here. And then more granularly, take a look at Newton Street, which you're doing already. Upgrade uh, system storage in the low, upgrade system storage in the high. Uh, install a new 12-inch main between presidential and Fisher. Right, make that connection. Uh, replace the 12-inch main on Lover's Lane, and then install a new. We call it. It's a. It's called a pitless booster station. It's a small package booster station um, to serve the Fairview Skyler Drive neighborhood. If you had to prioritize all six of those, in what order would you put them? Or are they sort of in the order? Are they all equal in what needs to be done? I think that's a great question, and it's up for discussion. But I would say. Um, I would say Newton Street, because we're doing Newton Street right, right. now. Yeah. Um, I would say make number four, make the connection on presidential Fisher Drive, because okay. it's a small piece of pipe and it, it does a lot for the system. Um, and then and then turn your attention to the storage in the low and in the high, right? That's been an, an issue that's been that lingering for a while. Lovers is the most critical piece of the it's infrastructure the, though? It's the most critical, both by putting in that piece on presidential and Fisher Road, it takes some of the pressure off of that line. It helps us move water away from that line. Oh, if it had to be CSX. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's CSX. It's another. It's another short line drive. Yeah. Same thing though. You dealt with downtown for the sidewalks. Yes. Um. This is though. It's um. It's it's been on our capital list for a while. It was one of the things we were we committed to doing prior to looking at a tank because there was a lot of controversy about tanks. Uh, and then after the tanks, doing the lower lane water main and the the um, it might be a toss up between once presidential and Fisher is done, it might be a toss up between the, the twelve inch main on, on Lover's Lane and the the fifth station, the new booster station in that neighborhood. Thank you. In terms of upgrading the system storage, would that be enlarging existing tanks or putting in another? So the, the plan has always been, and when we talk about Hopkinton connection, you'll see there's a, a, a change to that plan, but the plan has always been to add storage to the high service area, to increase the, the volume by adding a, a second tank in the high service area. So one of the things right now with the storage in the high service area is on the one hand, it's it, there's not enough usable storage, um, but also there's no redundant storage in the high service area. So it's very, very difficult to take Terra out of service if we need to do maintenance on it, right? Because it's the only tank in that service area, right? So we like to have two tanks if we can, so that we can take one out of service, paint it, do all the things that we need to do to it, and still have another tank in that service area. So if you brought up the map, where would that, where would the location of the storage tank actually be? Uh, so in theory, sure. So it has always been planned for uh, a parcel of land right here. Um, between, I think this is, is this Skyward Drive right here? I should. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Stars, yeah. Stars, yeah. stars and Stones. Fair 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 Fair. Yeah. We always call it the Fairview Hill Tank, right? yeah. and it's right here in the woods. Okay. So um, if you put that there, no. how, how, do you still need the booster pump? Well, what that would do, that's a great question. What that would do is that would that would keep pressure here nice and stable. Um, so it could, what it would do is it would, it would help keep pressure stable so that if I open up a hydrant, their pressure would not drop as much. Um, it might drop a little bit, but it wouldn't drop as much. But it doesn't change their overall pressure, right? So they would still get the same pressure that they get right now. So there might be customers up in this in these neighborhoods now that are getting 
you know, pressure that's acceptable, maybe 35, 36, 37 pounds, um, but not great pressure. So adding a tank there wouldn't change that because so it's going to be. Have, you still advocate for booster pump as well. Well, it, yeah, the booster pump would help them, would help improve their pressure. Would you also need the booster pump and how would that affect um, the water pressure or the, the flow of water in the rest of the system if you added another tank there? I mean, obviously, once you fill it up, there's a redundancy mm -hmm. factor, but in terms of when you have high demand, draining out of that tank will affect Terra or the other part of that system. Um, so the water will rebalance itself once we add this second tank. So we will start to change the dynamic between, well, and not between Terra and this tank because this tank doesn't exist, but Terra will perform differently. It'll it'll drain less. It'll, you'll still get turnover yeah. in it, so but you won't hold as much water. Overall, out. it might take a little bit of the pressure off the pipes after fill. Um, it'll what it'll do is it'll it will reduce the um, dependency on that one pipe, that lover's lane pipe. Right. It'll reduce the dependency on that pipe because that pipe carries pretty much all of the water going up to the Terra tank. So now some of that water will get redistributed to the Fairview tank. Um, and so not all of that water will go down this pipe anymore. Some of it will come down through this neighborhood and up to that tank. Okay. Yep. So it'll rebalance itself. Yep. Can I ask one, one question on, on just on tanks themselves? Yep. I was I don't know the answer. What is the like life service expectancy of a water tank with proper maintenance? With proper maintenance, we expect to get a hundred years okay. out of a water tank. Thank you. So, so given that we're looking at replacing two of the other tanks within the next, the ones that were built in the Yeah, so those ones are, in, they're in good shape. There's, based on the condition, there is not a need to replace those tanks right now. Um, like I said, we, we hope to get a hundred years out of them. Those look like if they continue to do the maintenance on them, it looks like we'll, we'll get more than hundred years out of them. They're in perfect right. shape. But in your recommendations, you would think that in the next. Well, yeah. So, so, uh, so we were just talking about storage in the high, right? How would we do storage in the high? Would we add a tank? So there, we would add a tank. In the low, what we would do is we would replace one of one or both of those tanks, um, and we would do that because particularly the Oak Hill tank, like I said, it's this tall, skinny tank. It's got very little storage per per vertical foot. Which means that if there's a, a spike in demand in that in that neighborhood, that tank drops. So you're not a different type of tank in place of one of those in the in the imminent future at some near point. Correct. Because then what we could do is not only increase the volume of water there, we would make all of it usable. So we wouldn't have any unusable water in that tank. Yeah. Question. If you do all the other improvements in the piping and everything like tower and other recommendations of the small pumping station we deal with. Are we still looking at having the same capacity size for tank and starts and stop? Or would that reduce, would we be able to reduce the size of it? It's, let me, I want to make sure I understand the question. So if we, if we make the piping upgrades and we add the small pump to mm -hmm. that neighborhood, would we still need the same size tank? Uh, we would, because two of those components, well, three of those components are based on just how much water you consume, not necessarily hydraulics. Um, and the second one um, is based on how much water you need for a fire, a fire event. So it wouldn't actually change the volume calculation at all. Um, it would improve how we get water around the system, but it wouldn't change the volume, and therefore it wouldn't change the size. If you had to choose between putting in a fourth tank or replacing one of the other 1930s tanks with a different style, which would you prioritize? That's a great question. Um, they both get at the same issue, which is a deficiency in storage. And it's hard to say, at least in the low service area right now, the low service area, you're more deficient in storage in terms of volume, right? You have a bigger deficit to make up, but you at least have two tanks, right? You have a redundant tank there. So you can take one out of service and do maintenance on it. So they have their both, they both have the same, have um, different kinds of issues that we're dealing with. Um, That's a great question. Um, I, I think because they both get at deficient storage and adding the second tank in the high solved that issue for you, the redundant tank. I think I would probably lean towards putting the, the storage in the high first. Build the fourth tank. Build the fourth tank and then move to the low and address the storage in the low. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to move on to the Hopkinton piece of this? I do. And open up a broader 
Yeah. Um, so I, I did a presentation on the on the Hopkins disease, and I'm happy to go um, over that again um, for those of you who missed it. So this is the presentation. This one is much much quicker, I promise. Um, so this is a presentation we did at the June 14th council meeting. Okay. Yeah. Is any of this different than what you? No, know, this is exactly on the slide board. It's exactly so. I was just going to hit the high numbers. Okay, perfect. Yep. Um, so, so Hopkinton, um, they're seeking a permanent connection to MWRA. Hopkinton has no um, MWRA infrastructure within the town, so they're hoping to wheel water through Southboro to Hopkinton. Um, they have some significant issues with their um, water supply that they have right now, particularly the wells that they use. And uh, John Westerling is here. He's the public works director from Hopkinton. Hopkinton. Um, so John, if I misspeak about anything, please, um, please interrupt. They also, so they have a lot of water quality issues with their wells right now, um, iron and manganese and, and recently PFAS um, in one of their wells. Uh, and they have a volume restriction, right? The wells just don't have enough supply right now for their, their summertime use. And so we're hoping to make a connection um, to Southboro, right? And so we spent probably the last year looking at how to physically make a connection with South Pearl work, right? And our, our two main goals here with when we looked at this assessment was, was to create a connection with South Pearl that would not have an adverse impact on South Pearl's customers, right? We don't wanna, we don't wanna do anything for Hopkinton uh, that's gonna jeopardize or do it at the expense of South Pearl. Um, and then we also looked, are there ways to, to create opportunities for South Pearl with this project, right? If we're gonna be investing a lot of money um, an effort into getting water from Southboro's connections to, to MWA to Hopkinton, we're going to be making a big investment in Southboro's infrastructure. And is there a way to do that in a way that benefits not just as neutral Southboro, but actually benefits Southboro? And so the things that we're, we're looking at, um, so we, we ran dozens and dozens of scenarios to, to try to get something that worked. Um, and this this, what I'm going to talk about here, this is what we call our option for. This is the last scenario that we looked at, what we think is the preferred option. Um, and what this involves, this involves um, actually um, upgrading both Hosmer and Boland, right? Making additional upgrades to those two stations, upgrading water main in a number of spots in town, and then actually replacing the Oak Hill tank. And that's that's key to this option, that's key to this, this connection with, with um, Hopkinton is, is replacing the Oak Hill tank with a taller tank that has more storage in it, right? So both taller and bigger. We would, all, we would eliminate four pressure reducing valves in town. Um, and we would, um, we would put in that booster station on Skylar and Fairview, that one, that little one um, that we were talking about earlier. Because that helps Hopkinton, that helps Hopkinton um, when they're drawing a lot of water through South Borough system, just like when, when I was talking about fire protection, right? If we open up a hydrant, pressure in that neighborhood drops. If uh, Hopkinton is drawing a lot of water um, from your systems, just like opening up a hydrant, right? They could drop pressure down in the system, particularly in that neighborhood. So we would put in this, this pump station that we were talking about as part of this project. And so what this does, um, like I said, we would make, uh, these are the benefits to South Borough for this particular project. Uh, and I'm happy to dive into the details on any of this. Um, the benefits to upgrading the pump station, right? They're not the most significant benefits to the town because your pump stations were just recently upgraded, right? We upgraded um, Boland in 2014 and we upgraded Hosmer in uh, 2019, right? So they're, they're relatively new. But what this would do is this would upgrade them further um, and essentially would reset the clock on the time for those for those pump stations, right? So if you get 30 years out of the equipment in there, that's going to reset the clock on that 30 years. It's going to start over again. So that's going to buy you guys a little bit more life in those two pump stations. We would be replacing and upgrading water main in various parts of town. Again, this is not this is a, a, a good solid benefit to the town, but it's the things that we're upgrading, the water mains that we're upgrading are not necessarily the highest priority water mains um, in town. But what they would do um, is they would improve circulation in town. They would improve fire protection in those areas where we're upgrading the, the piping. Um, and we would be taking older pipe out of service and putting in newer pipes. So again, it would reset the clock on some of that piping in your system. Uh, we're talking about probably about 5,000 feet of pipe total in your system. So about a mile of pipe uh, we, would, we would renew 
for you. Again, it's not necessarily stuck at the top of your list, but it would it would buy you some life in that fighter. It's when we start talking about old kill tank that we really start talking about some very significant up, uh, improvements to the town, some significant benefits to South Rome. So if we were to replace Oak Hill Tank, we would make it taller and we would make it bigger. And what we would do is we would match the hydraulic grade of the high service area. So instead of running, instead of running your system as two separate systems, we would now run it as one system, one at one hydraulic rate, right? So we would eliminate the high service and the low service, and it would just be one, one service area. So what that's going to do. Um, it would eliminate this sort of going from least significant improvement to most, most significant to the first thing it would do is we would be able to eliminate four pressure reducing valves that the town has in the system right now that separate the high and the low, right? That lets us move water, a little bit of water between those two zones. This would eliminate the need for those entirely. We could get rid of those. And those are just things that the town has to maintain on a regular basis. They're kind of a pain in the neck. Um, and we could get rid of those by adding we would essentially add 23 feet to the tank. We would add 10 PSI to the low service area. We'd add about another 10 pounds of pressure to the low service area. When we, uh, and the reason we're doing that is because when we ran the model scenarios for all these different scenarios where um, Hopkinton was drawing its peak summertime demand in the future, this was a build out scenario. At the same time that South Coral was, was drawing its peak summertime demand, you know, in the future, right? This is a very conservative assessment. What we were seeing is we were seeing some pressure in the southeast corner of town. I'll show you where on the system map. We were seeing pressure in, in these neighborhoods down here drop um, in, some, in some cases by maybe five to 10 PSI, right? Which is not a hugely significant amount of pressure drop. But when we looked at this, we said, look, we don't wanna let pressure drop more than say 10%. Right. If you keep it within 10%, people probably won't notice a change in pressure. 10% is not a significant change. But if you start getting above a 10% change in pressure, people will start to notice. So we want to keep everybody's level of service to kind of what it is right now. And so by, by adding 23 feet to this tank and adding 10 PSI, what we, what we did is we largely erased any pressure drop or any reduction in, in long-term pressure that we would have seen in this neighborhood. Here. Essentially, we would, have, we would have wiped that out. Right, by adding 10 more pounds to the system. So that's, a, that's one benefit. It would also improve fire protection in the low service area. So by adding 10 pounds of pressure to the whole system, that's a little bit more energy we have in our system to fight a fire. So that would improve fire protection throughout the entire low service area, um, particularly to that, that node, um, the Cordoville, um, Mount Vic, area where we had a deficiency before that will help us overcome that deficiency um, at that note. So that's, it's really gonna improve fire protection. It'll also help us to deliver water to the Ashland interconnection. The Ashland interconnection is right next to that tank. So this is the Oak Hill tank. The Ashland interconnection is right here. And they flow by gravity. When they buy water from Southboro, it flows to them by gravity. So if we add another 10 PSI pressure, we can push a little bit more water into their system and help them meet that million gallons a day that they that they get right and one of the keys to this not only no adverse impact on Southboro, but we also couldn't couldn't do anything to jeopardize um ashland's ability to get water so we couldn't do anything that would reduce the pressure at their interconnection because um you know they essentially have a commitment from the town that they'll be able to buy a million gallons of water a day and if the town did something to jeopardize that you know that would be a problem for Ashland. so we said no no impact to ashland on this no adverse impact at national. So adding 10 PSI, that's only going to improve our delivery capability to national. The new tank would be 100% usable. So we're taking the tank that you have in your system right now that has the least amount of usable storage, and we would make it 100% usable, right? We would change the style of tank so it's not a standpipe. We would make it an elevated tank so all of the water is stored at the top. So that would, um, that would really help your storage deficit in the low. By making that tank 100% usable. So to that point, um, like I mentioned, you guys have a significant storage deficit in the low service area right now. We could we could just about um, 
we could just about eliminate all of your storage deficit in the low service area with the new tank there and potentially eliminate all of the storage deficit in the entire town with a new tank at Oak Hill. Because now we're gonna run the system as a single hydraulic rate. So we don't have to talk about having two tanks in the high and two tanks in the low. If your system just has two tanks total at the same elevation, now we have the redundant tanks that we need, right? We can take Terra out of service while the new tank is online. We can take the new tank out of service while Terra is online, right? So we have that redundancy right there, right? So if we build this tank big enough, we could potentially eliminate the entire storage deficit for both the high service area and the low service area just by building one new tank. And so what that would do is that would go from, in the future, we're talking about potentially four tanks in South Pearl. That would reduce it down to three. And we're still we're still looking at overlook, but we may even potentially be able to eliminate the overlook tank and take you guys from a four tank future down to a two tank future with all of the storage that you need for the future. So that's probably the most significant benefit to South Pearl uh, with this project is that we would we would take care of your storage deficit. We put a bigger, new, brand new tank up there for you, um, and we would add pressure uh, to the low service area. And like I said, we may be able to um, potentially eliminate the overlook tank. We are looking at how that affects fire flow, but we may be able to eliminate that, um, that as well. We would do this in a way, this project, um, we would do this in a way that is phased and coordinated so that we would minimize uh, disruptions to customers in South Park, right? There's gonna be you know, construction work, we're gonna have to put pipe in the ground, we're gonna have to do construction, but we would do it in a way to minimize that disruption to the best that we can. We would repave all the streets that we're in uh, when we do this work. Um, and we we can do this work in such a way that we can actually take Oak Hill out of service temporarily while we build a new tank, right? That's the benefit of having two tanks in that zone, right? So we have another tank that we can rely on. So we're gonna do this in a phased and um, coordinated way. Uh, and then we're looking at spending, you know, potentially um, up to $8 million in the South Borough system with this project. Um, that's an investment in South Borough's infrastructure that's both the hard costs and the soft costs. So that's the actual construction cost plus the engineering and permitting uh, to make this project to make this project go. Does the existing land uh, parcel on Oak Hill have the capacity for a larger tank, or would there be sufficient? Um, I believe it does. I have to look at depending on what we land on first size, right? For the pedestal, not a problem. Um, the tank itself will be wider at the top. So we have to make sure that that tank doesn't actually overhang the property lines. Um, and so we have, when we decide on what the actual volume of that tank is, we'll have to look at the dimensions of it, make sure that it fits on that parcel. Uh, but I'm, I'm optimistic that it will. So before I open up to questions on this, John, is there anything that you want to add on your end about the project? Uh, Tim, you've been going strong for an hour and a half. I don't know what it could possibly <laughs> <call. laughs> Other than thanks to everyone who's uh, come out this evening and for uh, entertaining this uh, this request that the town of Hopkinton has. I want to thank uh, the town administrator and the DPW superintendent for their support along the way. And here to to answer any questions that uh, the two folks may have. One that I can um, think of off the top of my head is future build out requirements in Hopkinton and would those at a later date affect any draw on this? Uh, hoping that Tim has taken a breath. I'm going to defer to Tim because they did a build out analysis and a needs analysis. So what we did when we when we ran this assessment, we did look at build out for, for Hopkinton to make sure that you know we don't sell ourselves short, right? Permit enough water we need today, not enough for the future. So what we did is we looked at there at Hopkinton's maximum summertime demand which is uh, 1.8 million gallons a day. And we added, we looked at various different build out scenarios that had been done previously. And we looked at, you know, population projections. And where we settled was we said, we think probably a 50% increase over what is um, their current demand is right now um, would be adequate for the next, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. That that would be a significant amount of additional water to plan for. So that put the connection up to 2.7 million gallons a day. So that's their peak summertime demand plus 50% more. And we would anticipate, I mean, I don't think 10 years or more ago, people anticipated the legacy farm site development. Is there potential for future of that in Hopkinton that this would cover? Uh, I, I don't know what the 
what new developments are in the pipe in the pipeline, but this additional 50% would be allocated toward potentially new developments. It would be allocated towards uh, folks that live in town now, but that aren't connected to the system um, or potentially connect, you know, with running new water mains to new neighborhoods that their wells go. So what specifically it's allocated for, I can't say. Um, and what pipe, you know, developments they have coming down the pipe, I, I couldn't say. Um, to follow to follow on to that, if I can, uh, the, the base build out projection that PAR used was done by Weston and Samson. And that looked at a 20 year build out of vacant parcels. We have a much smaller distribution system of our water in the percentage of town that it covers than does Southboro. So large parcels that are left within that infrastructure that are open vacant land available for development, those are few and far between, and certainly there's no land mass that equals legacy farms. So although there may be some parcels that can have development, there's nothing of, of possible on the scale of a, of a legacy farms. But we could limit the quantity that we pass through potentially as part of the agreement to say X million gallons a day or whatever potentially. And we could do the same with water regulations and uh, water extensions, knowing that we would have a finite 2.7 million gallons per day that's available. So if a developer came in and wanted to extend the water main to service a certain number of homes, we, uh, the town, would be able to limit that or, or prohibit it if it takes us beyond the 2.7. We only want to build this once and we want to build it for our residents into the future, but not to, uh, not to create a great expansion of the town. For, for lack of the proper phraseology, and hopefully you'll understand what I'm getting. Do you currently draw some water from Asheville? We do. Uh, it, it's approximately uh, 500,000 gallons per day. Okay. Um, they connected to the NWRA. Uh, I think that their connection is just about complete where they can draw water. Um, that, that connection doesn't provide any benefit for the town of Hopkinton. They instituted water use regulations and when they could turn on that MWRA connection, such that the Hopkinton Reservoir is a great influence on their wells and the water that we purchase. When that reservoir gets down to the emergency level as dictated by DEP, that's the only time that they can open that, uh, that spigot to the MWRA. And at that point, they can't provide us any water. So there's no benefit to the MWRA. And in periods of drought, we've seen that half million that gallons per day go down to as low as 130,000 gallons per day when they simply can't provide the water that we need during our peak minutes. Is there any impact to the water that they have the ability to draw currently from South Row in emergency, whatever that would be going to Hopkinton, or is that not at all related? No, it's not. There's, there's no potential. And if we connect to the MWRA, this will be our sole source for water. Our intermunicipal agreement with the town of Ashland will no longer be necessary and we wouldn't be purchasing water from them. And maybe a slightly different line of question, but some of the things you said, you talked about repaving. Mm -hmm. So we are very used to in this town, someone opening up straight, like maybe a utility company, let's just say an example, opening up straight down um, a street and they patched it, but that's about it. Yeah. Clearly, you're going to be going down in the center of a street, probably opening up roads that Karen in the town may have recently paved, may have in the docket for paving, and maybe shortly in the future for paving. What exactly do you mean when you say you're going to repave and how are you planning to leave this? So, uh, good question. So, the way we have, uh, when we price this out, we priced out uh, a temporary trench patch to put over the, the trench again temporarily at, you know, after they put the water in it. And then coming back and putting in um, at least one lane of permanent uh, paving after that. So essentially put in a, a temporary trench patch and then come through after it has settled and mill out uh, part of that temporary patch as well as the top course of pavement and repave at least one lane of that roadway. Does Karen have a list of all streets that would be potentially impacted if this were to go through as proposed? Um, I don't know if she does, but we can certainly provide that. So one of the things we as a committee have been asked to do this year is to bet where the town is spending its road maintenance money. Sure. 
there's a lot of attention on it. Um, because of course everyone wants their road paved and it needs to be done, you know, tomorrow, right? So we're gonna have to make some some tough decisions in, in our recommendation. Like there's no pleasure in that job, I think I can speak for our group, but I think if we can see that potentially there's a project on a certain street that's already can dig up something, obviously money not well spent on our end to pave the street if you're gonna be coming along. So I'd ask that that get um, coordinated. The other thing is talk about height on Oak Hill, which I imagine others will probably have questions about. Does anyone know what would be required from a zoning perspective on that? If it were to go through as planned I and mean, you talk about height um, increase, is there a magic number there that would trigger obviously a full of set of input? Well, that's a great question. I would imagine whatever that, that height restriction is, I imagine the existing tank is probably already well above it. Um, but in the past, when we have built a new tank, we have had to go to zoning. Um, and a lot of times we will have to ask for variance, um, either for the height or for my property line setback. Because the Oak Hill um, tank, that parcel is actually, it's kind of common to have a tank like sitting like that on kind of a relatively small parcel. Um, and so very frequently the, the new tank will get uh, built you know, a little closer to the side of the front yard property setback than um, is allowed by zoning. So we will frequently have to go in front of zoning to get a, a variance for that. That's something we've done. So times. the reason I ask that is I have two more questions and I promise they're quick. Timeline, right? And this may be a, a joint response is obviously our boards collectively are listening, taking feedback, and ultimately probably going to send some letters or comments to the select board. What is the ideal timing that Hockington needs to hear something from our select board, which means that we would have to get any feedback to our select board well in advance of that. Our May town meeting appropriated the necessary funds for the design, the next phase of design for this project. We are waiting to execute a contract with Power Engineering until we hear back. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of steps that have to happen, uh, some in parallel and some in series. This would be the first major step for us to be able to uh, move forward with the next phase of design would be the, uh, the information or the ultimately hopeful, hopefully uh, approval from the select board. And my final question is you use the word we a lot. Um, you presented to us the South Pro Mass Air water plant, right? And then correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, you basically were representing popping then and also, so far as on both sides of this? Far as on, I, I don't think there's two sides, but yes, far as on, far as working for South Coro on the master plan and for Hopkins on here. Okay, and have worked with both towns historically for many years. Obviously your knowledge was- Yeah, I mean- that's, in depth of- Correct, and one of the reasons Hopkins engaged us for this was because of our knowledge of the South Coro system. Okay. Understanding that it would be of a benefit to, to you both. So my question is, how do we make sure, because as much as I hope that we can all work together to work some sort of, like how do we assure, because we're obviously representing the, the citizens of Southboro, how do we make sure that everyone's interests are, are properly um, managed in front, and basically just avoid the appearance mm -hmm. of any sort of conflict, even if there is no, like, right. just do you have any thoughts around that or how this would work, especially if we get into an actual construction project? Sure. Um, so we did this with, with Ashland, so just so you know, we, we did the Ashland Native Connection. Um, Ashland hired us through Southboro to do the design and the, the construction oversight on that project. Um, so there's some precedent for this. Um, but what you could do um, is you could engage a third party to do peer review, um, you know, make sure that everything is, is um, you know, passes engineering cluster. Um, that would probably be the easiest and, and sort of simplest thing for you folks to do. Um, and, you know, in Hopkinton may decide they want to have a third party peer review as well. This is a, a very, very significant project for, uh, for Um So that may be the simplest thing to do, um, is to have a third party look at all over. Okay. We can hear, hear review back. Well, it's a, I mean, because Hopkinton did use PAR because they are our engineer right. for the same reason um, Ashland did, but it, but yeah, they yeah. It makes, it makes a lot of sense, but right, right. Yeah, but so having a third party, is, and, you know, in case it needs sense. to be said, and I'm sure that, um, you know, there's I'm 100% objective on this project, right? Um, I'm not going to do anything for Hopkinton, um, 
at the expense of South Florida and vice versa, not just South Florida at, at the um, expense of Hopkins. Uh, you know, as a professional engineer, I have a certain standard I have to meet when it comes to protection of water systems, right? I have to do everything above board. Um, and I certainly can't do that, that here. Tim, if, if we go to an elevated tank um, at Oakwood, are there any higher maintenance costs expected on an elevated tank versus a standby? That's a great question. Um, it depends on the kind of elevated tank you put in. There are some, and I'm not recommending those types of tanks, but there are some that have very, very high maintenance costs. Um, and I'm not recommending that for this project. Um, there are some that have very, very low maintenance costs, lower than what we would expect for even the Oak Hill tank right now. Um, where your maintenance costs come in is primarily on the painting, right? <laughs> painting tanks are very expensive. It's hard to do, particularly on tall tanks, it's hard to do. Um, so if we built an elevated tank, we would probably, well, we definitely recommend a tank that has a concrete pedestal, right? Um, and that's a newer style tank that's been around about 20 years now. Um, that has very low maintenance on the pedestal. So we don't have to spend a lot of money painting the pedestal, but we do have to paint, potentially have to paint the top of the tank, right? And that's difficult to do because it's up high, right? It's gonna be, you know, almost hundred feet tall. So that's difficult to do. Um, but they do make tanks out there um, that don't require painting, that they have a glass fusion um, steel matrix on the top that doesn't require any painting in the future. And those tanks have a very low, um, what they call OPEX costs, operational costs. Um, but that is something that the, the town is going to have to seriously consider in terms of aesthetics because that tank looks very different than uh, the painted steel tanks. Um, and some people have a very strong preference for one or the other. So potentially you could put a tank up there that has, that has lower maintenance costs than the Oak Hill tank has right now. Um, potentially you could put one up there that's more expensive than the Oak Hill tank right now to make it. If you want to see one of those glass fused tanks, uh, right in front of the Hopkinton Middle School, yeah. there's, a, there's a dark blue tank that we installed maybe two years ago, and that's one of those glass fused tanks. And we, we selected it because it's zero maintenance. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, oh, oh, Josh. I, I have a whole bunch of questions, but um, what are Hopkinton's other options? Mm -hmm. Are they actually in water deficit, or is this really generating the future? We have. Uh, our water supply is not sustainable. We can't supply our existing needs. Uh, and the wells that we have, we have uh, eight groundwater wells. They all have iron and manganese to some level. And our highest producing well has PFAS levels that are above the maximum contaminant level. And there's nowhere else you can put wells to draw. No. And uh, we've, we've looked at the two options, the option of filtering the existing sources and the option of connecting the MWRA, the option of filtering those sources, even though they don't meet our needs, is approximately double what the MWRA connection would cost us. And there's no other direction in which you would go, or is this the most convenient direction? There, uh, there's no other direction that we could go. As I said, the town of Ashland can't sell us uh, enough water. They can't, they can't meet our peak demands in the summer, and their MWRA connection doesn't help us. Uh, there's no connection possibility to the town of Milford. Uh, MWRA was all kept coming up as the answer for the town of Hopkinton for today and into the future to provide the water that we need, the supply that we need, and the the, the quality that we need. When, when we talk about putting a third or fourth tank here in, in South Road, you're presenting this plan as, a, as putting in the tank at Oak Hill. It solves all our problems by putting in a raised tank which means that we really wouldn't need to put in a fourth tank. Right. But, we, but we could put in that third tank on Oak Hill ourselves right. without, putting, without this project. Would, would, is there an increased cost in us just doing that? Uh, an increase, yeah. So to do that project, the Oak Hill, in the budget that we have right now, we have um, Hopkinton participating in the cost of the, the new tank. And how much are they participating in the cost of putting in that tank? Uh, right now, and it's just a placeholder in our cost estimate, we have it as a 50-50 split. Um, between yeah. Hopkinton and South. And then, so then we would not need a fourth tank at all, and we would rely more heavily on the Oak Hill And then we level out the, the distribution in the system with a more even PSI. Correct. correct. Yep. Which would solve the, the issue with the low over apartment. Uh, correct. That would solve that uh, with with the addition of that, uh, with that, that booster. With, with the, oh, and the booster. Yep. 
and that will be paid for in the plan for the Yeah, so right now we have both of those. Um, again, it's just a placeholder, but we have both have both of those as a 50 50 split in the right. top of the plan. And in terms of doing the roads, you said that you were really only going to pay in half of it. it, it it all comes down to um, we're gonna we're definitely gonna pave everything we touch, but it comes down to um, well. But my, my question here is how you're gonna pave it because if you're only doing half a road instead of the full road, right. it still leaves us with the other half the road to deal with at some point. And doing with things like sidewalks, it's easier to put them in when you're doing a road. So by doing half a road, I don't think you're doing the south road any favors at all because we still have the problem of whether we want to put in sidewalks, which you want to combine with the road project, which you then have half a road that you have to. Right. So. You know, I see this as being a burden that we're becoming a municipality for Hockington in a lot of ways. And I know the upfront costs, they're paying some of that, but I think there are a lot of back end costs here that are going to cost us more. Uh, and moving forward, we're going to have to be far more careful in, in how, we're, how, how we're dealing with this financially and dealing with not only Ashley now, but Hockington as well. So, I mean, I, I think there's a whole lot of future planning, capital planning to do here that, that hasn't necessarily been fully vetted out. And, and those are the sorts of things that, you know, I think that are going to have to be done um, before certainly I would feel comfortable. Correct. Uh, on the paving, you know, there's there's two types of streets that we would be touching. Those are the streets that would be in your paving plan right now. Um, and so to, if we paved half of it, let's say that would potentially be half of the street that you wouldn't have to pay, right? You would only have to pay for half. Um, but then there would be streets that, that you're not planning on touching where we would be paving half of it. So then, to your point, you know, we pay half a street um, and you have half a street that's not paid. Uh, certainly, you know, a point of negotiation with the town of Hopkinton would be uh, how much paving would you uh, in these streets up front? Um, in Parkerville, you're talking about we do Mark Parkerville, picking that up. Which part of, of South Parkerville? The way to Route 9 all the way down or is it just from the Finn School down? I'm sorry, say it again. The, I believe part of the plan was to replace the main on Parkerville. Yep. Um, is the part only from Finn going down, or is it from Route 9, or how far does that extend up? It actually goes, um, it goes from Route 9 up to about here, where from here down, uh, new piping has been put in, or redundant piping has already been put in. So, you're, yeah, that's, it's, so basically you're dealing about from Route 9 all the way down to uh, about where we, we replace the middle down to um, ourselves. So that, that section from middle down is already been replaced. So it's really just from middle all the way to the night. The front of my house. I'm on the well. So none of this, none of this benefits me in having Hopkins can come in and dig up my road, pay half of it, and I have to deal with all the problems. Um, there's negotiation in here, and I'm not resistant to the project entirely. I understand the problem that Hopkins is having, and I don't think that as a good name that we should pay this. But I don't. When we're talking about benefits for us, it's not just the benefit of paying for half a tank that they need. It's, you know, there's got to be a little bit more, I think, for financially in, in the bucket here and an agreement moving forward for, for at least me as a, a member of capital to say that I think this is good for a good project to continue. I have some questions also. Sure. Um, going back to your original slide to select board about the improvements. Um, when I look through the, I think there are five major ones to talk about the improvement on Hosmer and Roland pumps, mm -hmm. pump stations, but they're, they're already in good shape. We talked about water main upgrades, but we actually called our system fairly robust now. Um, the new booster pump at Skylar seems like something that we could put in any, anyway. Maybe we should. Um, and that leaves the four existing pressure reducing valves. And I know that that is related to the Oak Hill storage tank, but I noticed that you didn't put Oak Hill storage tank in um, your master plan from 10 years ago. Also, in one of the prior reports that came up when um, Park Central mm -hmm. was uh, you know, being discussed and the water storage problems were, were being discussed, um, I think the idea of Oak Hill, you know, replacing that tank with a larger tank didn't come up then either. So my question is, um, you know, these problems have been existing. You've been our, our consultant for all these years. What would be the alternative to making a larger, to putting a larger storage tank? Uh, you know, to fix these problems to really help Southboro, what would be the idea to, to help us rather than putting in a larger storage tank? So you're saying without the Hopkinton interconnection, 
without that project. Yes, because you said that the, the plan changed because of Hopkinson. So I'm wondering what what would have been the plan to help Southport? Well, so the like you mentioned, the plan had, had been to um, to replace or to add storage in the high and then correct the storage deficit in the low by replacing uh, one or both of the tanks in the low. Um, when we started looking at this Hopkinton interconnection and we started looking at the challenges of getting the water to Hopkinton, um, it opened our sort of opened our eyes, if you will, to the possibility of a more, we'll say a more radical change to your system. So essentially what we're doing is we're we are we are reversing how your system has run for the last uh, almost 40 years and how it was actually planned um, even going back 60 years. Um, and so like I said, the the Hopkinton project kind of opened our eyes to uh, the possibility of changing all that um, and just replacing Oak Hill. So if Hopkinton were not around right now, we could replace the Oak Hill tank with some of these other projects, uh, including some of these other projects like the pump station on, on Skyler, uh, and that's the, for that neighborhood, and potentially correct that whole storage deficiency with you know one or, or two projects. That would be a significant benefit. So are you saying we wouldn't need a new storage tank at Oak Hill? No. The town, the South Shore needs more storage. That's the bottom line. And it's been that way for a long time. But my point is specifically the Oak Hill replacement hasn't come up in the last 10 years. It's because it hasn't it it hasn't been as high a priority as the storage in the hot. Is it high now for hot people normal? Uh, no, what has happened is when um, Ashton came online and we saw an increase in demand in the low service area, it put more pressure on the storage in the low service area. So it has it has risen um, in terms of its priority because there's now more demand there and the storage deficit there is more significant. And my last question, is there any alternative? This is one option, sounds like a good option. There's some pushback as you're seeing. I have a little issue with it as well. And I think as a good neighbor, we're also looking to help you. But I'm only seeing really one option, and I want to know if there's another option. Another option for Southboro? Yes, um, for Southboro. First, about I mean for Southboro storage issue. I guess I'm not quite clear on what you're looking for an option for. Uh, well, I think the idea behind what, what Capital is going to be doing is comparing really what what um, what would South what would be in Southboro's plan to move forward versus how does this fit into our plan? What's the differential in cost mm -hmm. and that? Sort of thing. Jason, you can help me out better with what you're actually going to be looking at. But um, you know, I'm just concerned that that changing the Oak Hill Tavern, what uh sort of to the tavern, um, the <laughs> tower wasn't part of the plan and now it's part of the plan. And I want to feel sure that it's not part of the plan just to help them. I got you. I, I want understand. to make sure that it's really helping Zephyr, yep. but I can't quite make that connection. Sure. And that, that's a that's a totally fair question. So like I said, you know, going back almost 60 years, the town of Southboro had always had envisioned that the town would have four storage tanks and that they would build that fourth storage tank um, at some point in the future when when demand got, you know, got to the point where they needed it. And the town has since surpassed that that demand threshold uh, many, many decades ago. Um, and like I said, it was most acute in the high service area. So past water supply uh, system uh, master plans have have progressed on that path, essentially. Let's implement the plan that has, we'll say it's been the town's plan for almost 60 years. Um, the town bought the parcel of land for that tank all, over 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago, um, to build that tank. So past master plans have essentially continued on that path. Um, this is the first time, and like I said, this isn't, if, if Hopkinton suddenly found a, another supply of water um, and didn't need South for anymore, I think the town should seriously consider still doing this plan, replacing the Oak Hill tank uh, with a taller, bigger tank, um, and then leveling up the two service areas. Um, so, like I said, it came, it was sort of born out of this project in terms of the challenges of, of servicing Hopkinton, had us thinking more creatively about, about how we could do it, and that's how this, this came to be. Um, but I think, like I said, if Hopkinton found another supply, I think the town should still, the town of South should still consider this plan, you know, raising the tank. What, what's the increased cost of building that tank versus having the fourth tank? Uh, an elevated tank is more expensive than, so the tank that we were going to build in the high service area was a, what we call a ground storage tank. Um, and we put the cost of that at about two to three million when we looked at it a few years ago. I'm not sure what the prime cost is, but that's what we put it at. 
Um, an elevated tank might cost here, you know, maybe four million bucks. So an yeah, elevated tank, nineteen thirties tank that we can that probably will be in replacing sometime like twenty thirty years. We put a bigger tank in there and spend four million, or spend two million on a fourth tank and maybe have to replace the nineteen thirty one anyway. But financially, it'd be a more of a push. Uh, well, no. So if you if you do anything with that 1930 tank, it's going to be a very expensive project. Uh, it's going to be you know to put any elevated tank on that site because you're not going to replace the Oak Hill tank with another stand pipe. No, no, no. What I'm talking about is if you if you have to replace the 1930 tank mm -hmm. and, and you're putting in a fourth tank, that'd be about two million a piece. And you're saying, well, we'll just put one big one on Oak Hill for four million. What I'm saying is the Oak Hill tank is not a two million dollar tank project. If you were to do if you were to do the high service tank for two million bucks and then replace the Oak Hill tank, that's not a two million dollar job. That's that's going to be more than that. It's going to be just for South Coral, it's maybe three three and a half. If you add Hopkins in, it's it, the expense is putting the water up in the air. That's where it gets really expensive. The volume increase is you know it does go up with volume, but the biggest expense is putting it up in the air. Um, and so if you were to ever replace Oak Hill as part of this plan as part of any other plan. We would recommend you go with an elevated tank, right. and that's that's a much more expensive project. Right. The storage so, isn't from Hopkinton, really, right? We're not correct. There's not a mm -hmm. lot of storage in those tanks for Hopkinton. It's really for us because they have their own tanks. They're just pumping through themselves. Right. So by Hopkinton checking in, reducing the need of another tank, you want to a second tank that actually reduces the cost itself. Correct. And what? It, yeah. Because they would. Essentially, you're, let's say the cost of those two projects, if you were to put a high service tank in and a um, replace the Oak Hill tank, I'm not sure what the exact numbers are, but let's say one is $2 million and one is $3 million, that's a $5 million gallons, a $5 million project. You do a $4 million project on that site and Hopkinton pays for half of it. And people will move on the tank. And then, of course, you're going to Sorry. Yeah, just just the one thing, but there has been discussion in the past plan to think about increasing the capacity on either the tank on Clear Hill or Oak Hill. Correct? Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's not just out of the blue, but correct. technology part of it is, is something worth not thinking of instead of just building a new tank on, on one of them. Sam or uh, Debbie, any other? At this point. Karen, I saw your hand up at some point. Did you still have a question? Or I go to the public? Oops. No, um, it was about paving and it was answered. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to keep the public. We are going to do public comment on this particular piece. We're going to change gears here. I mean, you need to change gears to another topic. So um, just I'd ask that any members of the public with their questions, keep them brief. And then this is not, there's no decisions being made. I don't have any, I'm not aware of any motions being made tonight, but obviously this has been a lot to digest, obviously in the first uh, couple hours. So Mr. Butler, I'll go to you first, and then we'll uh, come back to the room if any questions. Here's the floor, Mr. Butler. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can. Okay. Um, so my question for Parr is, um, since the 2009 master plan that you put together, um, there has been a, a, about a 16% decline overall in water usage in the town, and there's been a 6.5% population increase. So we've had about a 21, 22% per capita decline in water usage. Your you're forecasting a reversal of that trend to increasing usage, uh, just as you were forecasting that in 2009. Why, why do you think there's going to be a turnaround instead of a decline to being an increase? Because that increase is central to your case, that, uh, that switch from being a declining usage per capita to an increasing usage per capita is central to your case of needing extra storage. So the, uh, the big reduction in usage was, was just a handful of very large users in your system that switched to irrigation wells. That accounted for a big, uh, a big part of that reduction. Um, and there's not a lot of big users like that left that could switch to irrigation wells. 
I'll give you an example, shrubs and trees, they were your, they were your single biggest user um, in our 2009 report. They use a ton of water and a lot of that water is used in the summertime. They eliminated that summertime usage. Um, yes, but you, you broke down the usage between residential and commercial. They wouldn't be, the residential dropped 15%. So that's not them. The residential, um, I have to look at the numbers, but there is, I mean, the bottom line is you, you're you going to see your, as, to, as population goes up, long-term, you're going to see um, an increase in demand. You can only get a certain reduction out of like say conservation measures. Um, like Karen mentioned, like you put in a conservation rate and initially people will conserve water. And I think that got reflected in some of the, the usage that we saw. But then long-term, they go back to the way they were using water before the conservation rate. They essentially get used to the conservation rate. So have, the, we, the, so have we seen that? Is that is that no? I haven't looked at the usage patterns in the time period between two thousand nine and twenty two. Have we seen have we seen that reversal? So that um, because because it's a big deal that that we've had a sixteen a fifteen percent residential drop, residential being eighty percent of usage, and you're forecasting that to turn around and to be an increasing usage. And so that's a critical piece of this. I'm wondering if we've seen if we've seen that starting to pick up again. Have we seen that in the last five years? A, a pickup in residential usage in yes. the last five years? Yes, because you're forecasting that it's going to increase. In fact, your forecast for the future is the same as your forecast for the future was in 2009, just about the same number. And I'm just wondering why you think the past, the last 15, 13 years is not going to be the forecast for the future. I'm, I'm trying, and it's residential. We, you have to understand it's, re, it's 15, 80% residential usage in town and, fifth, and it dropped 15% uh, or, while population increased by 6%. So I just want to understand if you can, why you think that's going to turn around. I just don't think that you, we can, can we, I don't think we can assume that population is going to continue to go up and then usage is going to is going to go in the opposite direction. I think there were some adjustments that were made in residential usage over the last few years, but I don't think it's going to continue to go down. I think it will continue. I think it'll start to grow again as population okay. increases. I think okay, that's. I mean, fine. We we need to look at that closely, though. I'd say. Thanks, John. Any other comment on water? Okay. No, you, you should be as long as you speak loud enough, they all should catch it. Okay. Um, so I, I have three. John, can you just say your name for the record? Yes, of course. It's uh, John Reed, 34 Middle Road. Uh, so I, I have three questions and then I'll just close with a, with a talk. Uh, the first question is with respect to the eight wells in Hopkinton, will those be decommissioned in full? Yes. Uh, the second question was, uh, do the other tanks in South Carolina go away under this proposed plan? Right now, we would go to two tanks and we would have Terra and we would have the bigger Oak Hill. And okay. Have, okay, how old is uh, Terra? Terra's 1960. Can I go back to my first answer, which was too quick? They, they will not be used for water supply, for potable water for residents. I don't know if we will decommission those wells or do something else with them, perhaps irrigation or something like that. But they won't be part of the water supply for the residential commercial consumption. Okay. Um, so that, that could be important later on when we look at the, the, the operational budget or the, the cost of operating the system in the actual uh, projected usage, and that's very important to me. It's, it was uh, this is all. Uh, I, I think I I was under the presumption, and, and this was all based on the premise that uh, this would be the uh, the only supply, the only water supply to the uh, the town of Hopkinton. Just to be clear, that is the only potable water supply then uh, under this proposal. The NWRA water supply will be our sole source for. Portable domestic 
water usage. Okay, but air, irrigation could still be uh, provided via the wells. So uh, again, I don't want to tonight say that we're not going to use those wells because that hasn't been evaluated. We've got water quality issues with them. We've got uh, supply issues. There's also water management act permit issues. So I don't know what the ultimate uh, end use of those wells will be. Okay, very good. Thank you. You're um, and out of curiosity, and this is just appreciating uh, uh, in this type of uh, critical uh, infrastructure investment, uh, I'm really interested in being able to look at in uh, two, say two or three of those other options that were uh, also had some some merit and were uh, compared uh, before, say compared uh, by the uh, town of Hopkinton or others involved to ultimately uh, uh, reach this uh, reach this uh, uh, preferred approach of uh, uh, relying on uh, South Burrow's water system to be able to like water sure. to Hopkins. So I'd be interested in looking at that if, if that's available. Yeah, we're we're finalizing the report right now on the okay. outlines of other options. Um, and so this is the third question. Where uh, and this is just more to the geography of uh, the MWR MWRA infrastructure. Uh, where is the closest MWRA pipe? And I'm asking that question just to sure. it, it's going to actually feed into my uh, my closing thought. So this is uh, this is the system map for South Carl. So the two, you know, uh, MWRA treatment plant is just over the line over here, Marlboro. And there's two uh, aqueducts, and these are like 14 foot diameter tunnels um, that come out of the treatment plant and go toward the city of Boston. And one of them is the Metro West Supply Tunnel, and one of them is the Holtman Aqueduct. And so these these run right through the town of South Carl. And, and Salvador has a direct Boland at Boland. They have a direct connection to the Holtman. They also have a direct connection to the treatment plant in a separate pipe. And at Hosmer, the town has a direct connection to both pipes, to both the Metro West and the Holtman Aqueduct. And are there any arteries that flow south uh, from that, from the main no. new area lines that the no. flow in the Boston? Yeah. Um, so, so I guess my closing thought is this, that um, uh, this proposed plan, and this is looking at it through the lens of uh, critical infrastructure and, and the mere fact that uh, just like electricity and, and gas and water, uh, these are utilities that all the re residents depend on. Uh, this proposal, as I understand it, is creating a, an extended or an elongated radial fed system. And it is uh, so there's no looping, there's no uh, redundancy in that system. It is uh, Hopkinton. Um, if this if this plan were to actually progress, uh, puts both South Borough and Hopkinton uh, in a situation of uh, being entirely uh, fed by a radial fed system. Is that fair to say? I'm not sure what you mean by a radially fed. So that means if, if that water supply, and this is looking at it through critical infrastructure, if that tank were to be compromised for whatever reason, that's the new tank at Oak Hill, uh, that would compromise the entire water supply system for uh, both communities. If it were compromised, that's why we want to have two tanks. You know, every system we want to have at least two tanks so that we have redundancy. So if we replace Oak Hill, we would still have Terra as a as a backup to it. So under that arrangement, if you lose one of the tanks, both uh, both communities' uh, water system remains stable in terms of pressure and volume capacity and so forth. It it remains stable, but if you lost that tank, we would have to work to get that tank back online. But yes, having a second tank helps to keep the pressure stable. Uh, it's in our own city memorial, right? Because the tank isn't as important to Hopkinton. They're pumping into their system into their tanks. Our storage isn't. There's not a lot of our storage going to that. Right. So when we so when we in, increase the storage in South Park to accommodate Hopkinton, and I talked about those three different components of storage: fire protection, emergency storage, and equalization. Hopkinton has its own tanks that it can use to fight fire. It has its own tanks for emergency. 
All we're doing is we're adding a small amount of storage for equalization, right? That operational storage um, for, for Hopkins. Well, not for Hopkins, it's for Southport because Hopkins is now going to be a customer of Southport, just like every other customer. So we add a little bit of storage to accommodate that additional demand um, in that equalization bracket. So that's the only storage that we're adding um, as part of this project. <clears throat> If I may, based on your last statement, Hockington, similar to Ashland, will be buying all their water from Southboro. Southboro will increase the amount of water that they're buying from the other. Correct. All right. So I think it's time to move on to this topic, um, given the topic. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the next steps on this are as the members of Public Works Planning Board and Capital, you know, we'll reconvene, I think, in a couple of weeks, probably, in the interest of you know, trying to figure out how best to move this forward with additional data. What I would ask is if members of either committee have questions, um, Karen, I don't know if it makes sense for them to just send it to each chair, the chair combines the questions and sends them to you, or or how best you want to do that. That would be great. <laughs> just because, obviously, we want to make Best use of Tim's time too, and not you know, you did a great job on the fly with a lot of um protocols along the way. So, we just obviously want to make sure that we're um, you know, best prepared to kind of help move this forward if it is going to move forward. Is, is there a goal in sight to a bring this to a South Road Town meeting for the spring? Or we too soon with that process that mm -hmm. it wouldn't be then or where where are we trying to get to i'm going to defer to mark on what would be required at town meeting on the self borough side of this word proceed so i think i think any recommendations coming from these groups coming back to the select board are important um the select board, similar to with Ashland, they can enter into a memorandum of agreement with the town of Hopkinton. It's something that doesn't require a town meeting vote. Obviously, any funding that's required on our part as part of the project is, you know, town meetings the appropriating body. So, um, again, the, the engineering and design work has already started on their side, but nothing is certain until select board decides which way they want to go on this. John, do you know if, the, if there's a requirement for town meeting and opportunity to approve going forward with this? As I said, uh, the May 2022 town meeting appropriated the funds for the next phase of engineering. So uh, that next phase can proceed once we uh, have a hopefully a favorable response from the town of South Rome, the select board. Uh, Beyond that, when we get into capital construction, of course, we'll have to go back to our town meeting for those funds. But the funds for the next phase of design have been appropriated. We're just waiting for that phase to start until we hear from South. And to be clear, we are making a recommendation to our select board. Mm -hmm. Right. Jason, can I ask one thing? Okay. It is, um, can we get a copy of the presentation? That we did today. I thought there was a lot of very useful information sure. in that. Um, that would be appreciated. Okay. All right. To move the quarter yeah, of the road quickly um, on the process. Thank you all. Thank you so Thank much. You. Obviously. All right. So um, we are certainly not going to dive deep into another project tonight, um, but we do have on our joint agenda also quarter of the road, which is a um, FY23, um, I guess for our, it'd be an FY24 capital item to be approved potentially at the 2023 annual town meeting. We capital, I've heard about this project since inception. Um, Karen has made many presentations. My understanding is at least a couple of years ago, Public Works Planning Board was very involved in the initial stages of this. COVID hit, and obviously there's no mechanism for carrying to hold the appropriate level of public resident feedback. And the, the project has kind of been sitting in every year. We just capital we met with her and she's like, push it to the next year. Well, my understanding is this is now the year that at least we need to vet it. Um, so I thought knowing that that conversation not necessarily was going to go 
two and a half hours, but um, knew we were going to be up against the clock, at least with my thoughts on a piece of paper. I did have a brief conversation with Mark and Karen to formulate it just to make sure it worked with the engineers that aren't here tonight that would be responsible for that project. But I think at least my view from the capital side, and I'll let you speak to me, Wayne, um, we need to help with what we think the residents want a voice in early on and obviously have this project well vetted so that there can be an informed decision by both the select board and advisory who make obviously official recommendations uh, on meeting on whether this is the right time, the right cost, the right project, etc. So I would welcome comments or questions um, from the group on that particular topic. I'll start with PWPV. I'll just mention as the newest member of the committee, I don't have any of the plans, so I'm just wondering if they're on the website, but like we can I can I can email them to you also if you want them that way instead. Can you maybe just give them is it time just to give us a little brief overview of your thoughts on the project? I can explain the project did so it's um this all actually started with Legacy Farms, as a matter of fact, um, that not that Cordoville wouldn't have been an important project anyway, but um, we were looking at trying to make it a TIP project at one point. The TIP changed during Main Street project um, into being that you need sidewalks on both sides. We don't have that kind of access there because of wetlands. Um, so we, we went the town route, um, but the idea was that we thought Legacy Farms was probably going to send a lot more traffic up Porterville to get to Route 9. Um, so it's in order what we're trying to do to the road, fix the drainage, add, add a shoulder on both sides, four foot shoulder and sidewalk. That's ADA compliant. So that's the entire project is for. We have the right of way for it. We just don't have one, obviously, the one. Karen, can you tell us where it starts and where it ends as yep. far as Portland? Um, so it um, it actually starts really at the intersection of Porterville and River Street, and then it heads up and it goes really to the DPW yard because then we end up with the bridge, which is mass yep. mass highways. Then there's a little piece, and then you end up with the causeway, um, and that's really just one of the DPW project. Thank you. So, and I think part of our plan is to get, I mean, everyone's a little frosty on this. Um, so I think the, the plan is to get all the documents out in August, but I think we know that the town isn't necessarily as active in these sorts of projects and may think we're trying to, you know, move something too quickly if we start holding public hearings or, you know, listening sessions about the project in August. So that was the kind of magic of use August to care and get all the documents in one spot start posting them for people to review them at their, their leisure. And then come September, really start this vetting process and presentations and really educate people on, on what it is, because it isn't just a normal road project. Um, Mark, can we put something on the town website with the link maybe to portable road project um, in the news or something sure. there, so people can easily see it from there? And then the link to what's already online through the DPW website. And as we start gathering more information so we have to get out to the public uh, so they can, so, uh, should they, so we can point out that we put this information out there. Um, uh, if I can add to that as well, I think, Jason, thank you for putting this timeline together. I, I, I think this was great. And maybe putting the timeline as well, Mark. On the website as well for the public to see kind of the direction we're looking to go and, and the, the time frame in which we're looking to do it. So, Jason, thank you for doing this. This was very helpful. Because if, if we can make the information to people wherever they are this yeah. summer, you know, then it's not as critical because we know a lot of stuff doesn't make, get accomplished at meetings during the summer because of the way it's up and you get the library. But, you know, if you have some spare time, <laughs> where you are during the summer, whatever, that you can start looking at some of these things and, and gather your thoughts and ideas for potentially a meeting after Labor Day 
uh, soon after to, to get going on this and start out as a yeah, um, Actually, can we do we always have that issue of people not knowing everything's on our website? Because <clears throat> yeah. every plan is on, like, DW has a ton of stuff on the website, just don't look at it uh, on that page so much or can't find it. Um, if there was an overall projects page that popped up at the front that to drop you over to, would that be easier? Or like, I don't know you how to get it up website? there. On the, because it's the town's website, right. just our, our pages are, I don't think well visited. I, I, would, I would say yes. So you can click on it, you know, something on the town's, like the banner, the town's main website. What about under project updates? So uh, I know what you want. Yeah, I'll, I'll write I, 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 yeah, okay. think, and, and then bring it into where, you know, you're linked if you have to bring everything together on your website, whatever else, but that it's there. And you make an area where people can make a comment like, hey, I'm trying to find this, I don't see it on your website. And somebody can respond to that through, mm -hmm. through the web, whatever. I mean, because we all know the more information that we can get out to people in advance, they don't always read it. You know, they don't always go to the meeting, but the more we can provide that might help people who are really interested in it, I think it's beneficial to have. And to us as committees that will be looking into it. I think it's exactly what Jason's timeline has done here. Yeah, it's just a couple of months here to begin to pull that together and to be prepared for more public participation input in September. I do have one follow up question for Karen, if I may. Uh, Karen, I vaguely recall during the prior public work planning board meeting about this that you had money for the project at some point in the past. Is that not correct? So we we had $30,000 from Legacy Farms. We had money for, um, we were planning on using complete streets money. Complete streets is what I remember. The only yeah. problem with the complete streets, and this gets into just the way every, again, nothing's linear. We can't get new complete streets money until we spend the old complete streets money that we've already been allocated, which has a CSX crossing, which CSX is um, digging the hill in a little bit. They've stalled somewhat on that. Um, so that piece might not be able to come out of there, or we'd have to. I, I think if we could just we didn't want that money anymore. We're, we're, that's been delayed, but not by us, and then go. But that's a decision that needs to be made by the select board. So we have no money for this from other grants at this point. We don't. Well, we don't have because you can only have four hundred thousand dollars at any one time out of complete right. on complete streets. So we currently have a contract for four hundred thousand dollars worth of work on Newton Street and CSX Crossing. It's supposed to happen this fall, but if it if CSX doesn't come through, which I'm not confident in them, we then need to undo that money and say, well, look, we want to, we want to allocate through, because this is, Portable Road is on, is on our complete streets. For, you know. That then leaves us short for Main Street. It, so then, then if CSX came and decided that they were going to do the work, right, and they said, because we can't get a timeline on it, and it's part of our problem. If they come in and then they say, oh, we're going to do the work, we would need to be able to have that money available to pay them to do it. It's been designed, the, the engineers, everybody's been doing it, but like everything's set on their end, but they they are currently not actively interested in doing the project, the project. Again, money sounds to be a significant issue here, so I'm not quite sure what the answer is, but. Uh... So let's if we stick to Quarterville Road though. Um, one of the items that we had on the agenda is there is federal funding for like one time for like once in a lifetime type funding that came from the infrastructure bill for projects like this. Right. We heard that where in Karen just wants Debbie's question, um, is clearly connected basically to the MBTA station. It's gonna be adding, improving accessibility, sidewalks, et cetera, is, is the goal of it. Um, this is clearly not a project that I think any department head, no matter if they have nothing on their plate, could go and write a federal grant for on their own. You know, my suggestion, we can decide whether a motion and as joint committees, or we just have a sense of the committees, is that we should request the select board. Um, you know, they have a consultant that they're using related to ARPA. I'm not aware of whether that consultant does federal grants or not, but you know, Mark can certainly look into it. Really have the select board. A, make sure they're focused on it with two members sitting here right now. Um, 
and see if they would be willing to put a little money, whether it be from existing budgets or ARPA, to look into federal funding for this, because I'm not aware of many other projects that would fall within that. And I continue to see the program advertised. I have no idea the likelihood of success, but it's a lot of money. And um, I think we owe it to at least consider it. It may not pay for the whole project, it may pay for the whole project. I don't know what the matching is, but um, Sam, to your point, obviously, we have plenty of money. We have plenty of things you could spend road money on. So obviously, we could solve this problem um, in any way, shape, or form. Every one thing. So I don't know the appetite of anyone. If anyone opposed to that um, sort of premise, otherwise, great idea. I agree. But what's the total bill for the project? Um, it was two point five. Five before. Carrying two point five in the capital plan, but I plus think that's the inflation and. It's a pre pre COVID number. Yeah. Well, well yeah, and, so and three supply three. chain issues too right now, yeah. getting pipe, and that's that's a worry because we have. The street came out okay. Yeah, we we were lucky with that one. But we are very lucky. lucky. By the time that this comes into play, that maybe some of the supply chain issues and things Hopefully that will come down a little bit. The market will drop in twenty twenty four. We can help. Yeah, I'm going to be the hopeful one. Well, you, I mean, <laughs> if, if theoretically, if, if we vetted it and it went forward at some meeting in the past, you're going to know March of 2023. Right. So right. theoretically, Karen would be bidding it next summer. If, yes. If, if oh, you went to put in your plan. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Or sometimes you guys want us to bid ahead of time so that you know the exact amount of that meeting that you might need. That was so do you want Mark for sitting here to take back to the board of selectmen? Yeah, the will and looking at everybody here would be to, you know, uh, ask the question of Jennifer whether she writes grants and you know, I would think we're gonna ask Jennifer. Yeah. I like that much better. Thank you. So relative to problems with CSX. Yeah, we should probably avoid that topic because I don't think it's on either agenda. Okay. But I was call Karen. Good to call Karen. It's not the one calls malls, or we can add it to a future event. I just don't want to get anyone. No, I'll thank you. Mark. I'll, I'll on that. Okay. Um, is there anything else we want to do jointly? That's pretty much what we have. We've, we've covered everything there. So I would uh, make a motion to adjourn the public works planning board part of the meeting. At it's actually off the list. It's 10 02. 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 It's the next meeting for us to uh, figure out how we can do these and have meetings ourselves. Well, we're back to remote now. Thank you. It was extended. The remote meetings were extended through. Darn. Yeah, through March. I like, so I like public. They were signed. So. Okay. Hybrid is good. Thank this you, everyone. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So for members of Capital, we basically have half an agenda left of a meeting. So I think you have uh, the choice tonight of. We can adjourn and post a Zoom meeting in the very near future um, to accomplish the rest of our business. We're not going to be able to wait very long on some of these things. Or we can go do what I believe in 15 minutes of the high priority items and then schedule our next meeting. All right, Karen, is that okay with you? Yes. Sorry. I'm talking to Karen. Oh, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Uh, yeah. All right. So, uh, what I in order of priority, um, while Karen Galligan leave, um, is obviously we've talked a lot about road maintenance funds uh, for the year. Karen has put together a preliminary plan of items that she, um, based on what she knows about the roads, et cetera. Um, think we need some further discussion. Um, obviously, we, we know that the um, pavement management program is going to be coming before us for vetting 
but that's going to be a long time before that's like actually implemented and executed. And there's clearly some roads in need. So what I want to do tonight is not talk about the viability of any plan that Karen has. What I want to talk about is the process that we capital are going to undertake so we can advertise as soon as tomorrow what we are going to do on this. So I think, Karen, the question to you is, when are you planning to go out for an RFP related to other road maintenance funds? When would be the ideal time that you'd like to know that? Um, I should already have been done, done it, but um, I would like to be able to at least have it advertised to the end of August. We can open early September and see what we can get done this year. I hate to have some stuff sit another. I'd like to have a trench sit the winter, but not necessarily two. Okay. So, um, in, are you going to need select board approval? Is there chapter 90 in any of this? Um, yes. Um, most of the funding that we have right now is chapter 90. That's available to us. Okay. So, technically, our role is to look at the money that's appropriated by annual town meeting, which I think you're probably going to resolve too, but we'll look at it holistically and obviously select board can do what they need to do from the chapter 90. Do you have a date yet of when you're going to the select board on that particular topic? I'm looking behind you too at Mark as well. I do not, and I um, usually I that I don't have to. Um, although things obviously have changed, but once the list from here is done, I usually just go and say I need, you know, it's just a a memo to them about this is what the chapter ninety allocation I'd like to use it for. Okay. So Mark or Lisa, when is the August select board meeting? August 9th. Do you theoretically need capital to weigh in before then? Uh, the agenda is is getting a little bit mm -hmm. heavy as as we sit for for that. Um, it wouldn't be bad to have a recommendation prior to so that we have that available to us. The next scheduled meeting is September 7th and then September 20. Um, I think we're going to need another meeting maybe later in August. I hate to say that, but yeah. okay. I think we're just going to need to. So, and obviously, you can't speak to the board, but there's potential that they could call a special meeting and have other topics on this. Yes. If they want. Sure. So, so, part of my rationale is I don't want to be accused of rushing this, but I think we all understand you only can pay at certain times of the year. Um, yeah. And there's some things Karen wants to let sit over the winter as well. And um, I think there's no shortage of opinions in this town about the quality of some roads. And um, I'm looking to get some consensus around you know, some of those. Um, but I also want to give notice that we're doing this, especially I'm very cognizant we're doing this during the summer. So I would do this via Zoom. Um, and, and I want to give two weeks notice in the spirit of, of call Mr. Dennington's um, bylaw. Um, although I don't think this is a required public hearing, I think if we align within that, we advertise it the right way and um, go forward on, on those, those you know, allow written comments to come in to us as well, have Karen publish the list ahead of time of where she's thinking and kind of what things are on the border, um, right? So that people can see what's potentially, you know, I don't want to call it plug and play, but like take this out, put this in. Um, but I think Karen, you've heard some comments tonight around, you know, what other projects be potentially digging up anything that you had in your plan. Do you have full visibility to that? Uh, so I want to use some time to like digest everything you've heard tonight too. So what I'm going to suggest is I will, and I'm going to on the calendars now, and Tony did drop off. So um, I will canvas all of us with a few options tomorrow for a Zoom meeting in August. It'll be at least two weeks out, probably at least two and a half to three weeks out. I want to make sure Karen's available for that discussion as well. We'll advertise it, and we'll then have the discussion around that. And hopefully we can make a decision that night. But if we can't, we need to be able to articulate why we can't make a decision and if we're hopelessly deadlocked on something, obviously the select board is just gonna have to weigh in on the chapter nine piece. Okay. And everyone good with that plan? Karen W, any comments? Okay, all right, that was main item number one I wanted to accomplish. Uh, 
we don't have meeting minutes. Uh, main item number two is we were um, all just reappointed um, for this year. It's probably a, even though it's a year long appointment, it's probably a three month appointment because the second the attorney general approved the bylaw from the annual town meeting, we'll be reappointed again on staggered terms based on what the bylaw says. So um, I think it's appropriate to have a committee reorganization at the beginning of every year, but this is a odd year. So I either want the committee to decide we're gonna delay that until we are truly the CIPC, or um, I want to um, potentially hold nominations, but I also am cognizant we're now missing a member. So I just wanted to see where everyone was at just on general path forward on this. So Jason, I, are you interested in continuing in your role as chair? I would if no one else wanted to step forward. Uh, Joe or Jeff, I, I'm assuming we're probably all fine with that. Yes, I agree. Very good leadership. I yes. agree. So that yeah, being said, Karen, are, are, are you interested in being chair? Are you comfortable with me nominating Jason? Sounds good to me. Okay, and I think we've got the majority of this, Jason. So if you're willing, I, I make a nomination uh, for Jason Malinowski to continue as chair going into the next year. Second, seconded by Joe. Um, we are going to have to do this as a roll call. Any further discussion? All right. Uh, Rasha? Aye. Park? Aye. Palmer? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Malinowski is abstained. Jason, thank you for all your leadership and continuing. Thank you. Um, to the continued trust, we'll get to do it again in three months, though. So that's okay. Um, that's okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Vice Chair. For anyone that wants, willing to step up, I'm looking at the screen, I'm looking down the table. Who's the Vice Chair now? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, I, if no one wants it, I'd be happy to do it for the next three months until. <laughs> All right, I'm going to make a motion to nominate Lisa Frasho as vice chair of the Capital Planning Committee. There's a second. Second. Any further discussion? All right, uh, Frasho? Aye. Park? Aye. Palmer? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Malinowski is aye. And I will say, as, as we look forward to in three months doing this, obviously, I didn't know I was vice chair. So that tells you how much time and energy the vice chair puts in. So the, the just, Zoom environment <laughs> has been confusing because people used to miss meetings and now you don't miss meetings really. Um, so, Jeff, I know you're not going to want this nomination, but in the spirit of continuing for three months, I think you have I'm, I'm su full support. So, I will nominate Jeff Park as a uh, clerk of the committee. Second. Second. Second by Lisa. Is there any further discussion? All right, uh, Rachio? Aye. Park? Palmer? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. And Malinowski is aye. So that one carries. And the only other thing that I thought was important, other than if there's any final public comment, was the Community Center Exploration Committee. I cannot tell when the select board are actually going to move forward on this or not, but it, you know, we talked about our last meeting. I drafted a charge with Mark. Select board um, did choose to move forward with it. We need to bring forward another capital member. Library is going to send forward a member. Recreation is going to send forward a member. COA is going to send forward a member. And for now, there's three resident at large positions that they've already started to advertise. So we as a committee need to um, pick someone to move forward. For anyone that's interested. <laughs> so. Jason, I'll take this opportunity with this lull in the conversation. Um, is I, I wouldn't be surprised if the select board maybe tries to move this forward a little bit on August 9th. So if you fill the four positions with representatives from existing boards and committees, you would have a quorum to begin to move this forward. I told the select board this the other night. Um, and if there's any public interest and they do some interviews, you know, I, I think the committee could move forward, could begin to move forward maybe sometime in August. So if, if there is, if you do have a representative tonight, that would be helpful. Um, if and I put it on my priority list because I got that sense sitting there listening yep. to um, the discussion. 
All right, so I'm hearing a little in the conversation. Uh, I am more than willing to help kick it off because I think I would probably have to go and make a few presentations to begin with. Um, I am more than happy for someone to transition and take over um, any of those sort of uh, responsibilities from the capital perspective moving forward, but I am happy to serve um, in the interim to help move that thing forward. I make a motion to appoint Jason Malinowski to the Capital Planning Committee, Kevin Improvement, and Planning Fail. I'm sorry, Mitch and Zeth. Yeah. I have a headache. I'm done. I make a motion that we appoint Jason Malinowski to the Community Center Exploration Committee. Sorry, Jason. Is there a second? Second. Right? second. I, there's been a motion. There's been a second. Is there any further discussion? All right. Uh, roll call vote. Rocio? Aye. Park? Aye. Palmer? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. You know, Malinus is abstained. All right. Second. All the other items we can punt to a future agenda. I will probably source um, dates on that. Is there any public comment? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Oh, so, John Marie, 34 Midwell Road. I think it might have been during the last uh, capital planning uh, committee meeting, and I asked for uh, a presentation that uh, perhaps captures the, uh, the projects that are approved uh, under to be completed under ARPA funds, or, or some some form of a presentation that I would be able to you to understand what projects were vetted and um, as I understood it approved by the ARPA committee that has since been disbanded. Is that presentation made available to me? Um, I think it well, it should be to post on the town website. But John, if you send me an email tomorrow, I'll send you a link to what we got, which is when we started vetting it. And it's I, I'm just looking on my phone at the meeting date. I'm pretty sure we did it at our 524 yes it's in our 524 meeting if you look on the town clerk's website our minutes are there and the attachments in there it's this arpa community final report that's what we as capital received um and kathy's not here anymore but kathy is chair of the select board and the select board have full financial um decision making on that funding they continue to maintain their own tracker of what they've actually accepted from those recommendations yeah, so also look at each of the select board packets mm -hmm. that has a I'll call it a more comprehensive listing of what's actually moving forward and what's under consideration still okay so that's in the latest select board package yeah and july yeah july 12th yeah. meeting you'll see a list it's, a, it's an excel spreadsheet that was in the packet which gives you everything the select board to prove to date everything else okay. that the uh our committee has recommended which is still on the table for consideration. Mark, that's a presentation that showed at the uh, select board meeting in the, the overhead where it showed some, some of the uh, the line items for the ARPA approval. So I'm going to say, yeah, it's been up on the screen. Yep. Okay. All right. So, Jason, if, if you do not hear from me, uh, okay. after you I found it. May 24th. So, uh, thank you for that. And this is maybe perhaps more of a comment, just listening to all the discussion as a as a resident and trying to follow in this sense all the money of these projects, of these various initiatives, the affordable road and uh, the, uh, the, some of these paving projects and so forth. Is it feasible? I like, I really appreciate the uh, concept of giving some, uh, establishing some form of a, a project status website or, or a web page uh, is that is it possible to also include those projects that are being funded under our or otherwise or was that can be more limited to portable road yes there is if there's any uh say uh noteworthy projects that are uh being planned uh, let's say via uh, uh, funding from arpa or otherwise uh, could could those be posted for the the residents to understand and try to digest heading into September? I think I think that's something we could do. I think the the um, um, the pitfall is when you do it, you've got to keep it up, mm -hmm. and you've got to continue to update it. 
and um, and and that takes a lot of a lot of time and effort, and you know, but but I think it's something we can start to try to do with at least the major projects that we've got, and try to provide that information, that update. There is a section up on the website for project updates, and so if we can start to um, you know to do that for some of those projects and get that rolling, um, I think that's something we can make. Change. Okay, and as you know, the one that's near and dear to my heart is the culvert. And so, just to, to being able to go to the website and just being able to capture the essence of the, yeah. the latest in progress, even if it's a, a once a one sentence bullet point yeah. uh, summary of the latest progress, okay. that would be appreciated. Thank you. Okay. So, we're do a Q4 um, capital projects update, which is covers all funding for all capital projects. So you'll see that in one of our future meetings, probably August, September, at the Brian in this month, but he's not here. So yep. whenever Brian goes with his operational update, there's now a capital update, you'll start to see that. Obviously not a penny has been spent yep. in the North Pole yet, but there will be pretty soon, probably, if it has already started. Appreciate it, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, we do need to make a formal motion with Bo Paul to Adjourn. So I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. All right. There's a lot of seconds. All right. <laughs> adjourn. It's a unanimous second. Um, no further discussion. We'll do a roll call vote. Rachio? Aye. Park? Aye. Palmer? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Okay, Malinowski's aye. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night.